So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SIRPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and other visual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. 
sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and other visual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna ang gusto ng government. 
two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the PIDS webinar series where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila C.R. and I will be your moderator. Friends, our topic for this week is smart cities. In the Philippine Development Plan, implementing the smart city principle is regarded as an essential strategy for making cities livable, efficient, and resilient. 
This afternoon, we'll examine the readiness of Philippine cities for smart city development, the challenges they face, and what needs to be done to facilitate their transition into smart cities. To officially open our virtual event and give us more information about today's topic, I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta, Jr. Sir? Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the presence of those who choose to be with us today. Uh, from government, we have administrators, planning and admin staff of the following local government units, Albay, Albu Albuquerque, Antipolo, Baguio, Butuan, Cagayan de Oro, Calapan, Caloocan, Camarines Norte, Carmen, Carmona, Cavite, Cebu, Cotabato, Davao City, Davao del Norte, Digos, uh, General Emilio Aguinaldo, Usi Panganiban, Cabugao, La Union, Makati, Malabon, Malolos, Muntinlupa, Palawan, Quezon City, Quirino, San Fernando, San Manuel, San Mateo, San Simon, Santa Rosa, Talisay, Tanawan, Tarlac, and Tugigarao. From the Department of Foreign Affairs, we have Assistant Secretary Eric Tamayo, Consul General Susana Paez, Vice Consul Jackie Lub Merigan, Diplomat Marian Ignacio, and Director Arlene Gonzalez Macaisa. Uh, from the Philippine Guarantee Corporation, we have Senior Vice President Nilia Huandasan. A Senate, from the Senate Economic Planning uh, Office, we have Executive Director Merwin Salazar, and Directors and Regional Directors of the Department of Information, Communication and Technology, Department of Science and Technology, Department of Trade and Industry, Bureau uh, uh, of the Philippine Standards. From the private sector, we have uh, RIS Philippine Consulting Company founder, uh, Johnny Paul Lagura, ACC Technology Consulting Incorporated President and Chief Executive Officer Amais Aguas, IBIS uh, Solution President and CEO Nathaniel Marquez, Test Consultants Incorporated President and Chief Operating Officer uh, Dumail Sayari, Convergence Reality and, and Development Corporation President uh, George C, Central uh, Cebu Board of Directors Incorporated President uh, Abonjo Bulciano Jr., Global State Resource Incorporated Vice President Maria Rica Samson, PhilServe Judetic Services Vice President Rian Raltisabar, Udina of uh, Infrastructure Corporation Assistant Vice President uh, Manuel Hamunir, Kimonis International Country Director Melissa Agabin, Directors of Manila Waters uh, Company Incorporated, Yung Song Industrial Philippines Incorporated, and IT Business uh, Process Association of the Philippines. From the academy, uh, let me acknowledge the following. Imus Institute of Science and Technology Chief Executive Officer Incarnacion Raralio, Agusan del Sur State College of uh, Agriculture and Technology President Joy Capistrano and Vice President Fernando Marzo Jr., Cagayan State University President Orduja Alvarado, Cagayan de Oro Technical Vocational Education uh, Institute Vice President Maria Trinidad, Ateneo Dinaga University Chairperson Kim Kathleen Sadi, University of the Philippines Virata School of Economics uh, School of Business Dean Joel Tan Torres, University of the Philippines Mindanao Dean uh, Los Viminda Gomez, Pangasinan State University Dean June Camara, University of Bohol Dean Am Amon Dennis Tirol, Directors from the Cagayan State University, uh, Batanga State University, University of Manila, Cavite State University, University of Visayas, and Philippine Science High School, Caraga. From the CSO and NGOs and INGOs, we have the following. Embassy of the Philippines in Berlin, Charity Affairs, uh, Ad Interim, Lilibet Puno. Lorma Community Development uh, Fund Foundation Incorporated, Executive Director Ando Cesar Rimando. Cebu Uniting for Sustainable Water Foundation Executive Director Socorro Atega, uh, Bankers Association of the Philippines Director Arnel Almaden, Subdivision and Housing Development Association Administrative Director Rusali Abad, Bukidnon Tribe Kapuunan to Mga Dato Chairperson Zimuel Perino. Let me acknowledge our friends from the media, 
And finally, let me also greet our friends, uh, our guests and uh, colleagues from government, academe, civil, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS and Serpy Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Today we will talk about the readiness of the Philippine cities for smart cities development. This topic is especially relevant to Filipinos given the numerous and persistent problems in the country's urban scene, despite the important role that our uh, cities play in regional and national development. The Philippine Statistics Authority reported that majority of the Philippine population in 2015 resided in the country's urban areas. While this could be an opportunity for local governments or LGUs to leverage human capital, it could also bring many issues. For example, in a uh, 2017 uh, World Bank report titled Philippine Urbanization Review Fostering Competitive uh, Sustainable and Inclusive Cities underscored that it is not uh, well planned and uh, uh, urbanization could, res could result in increasing inequalities, crimes, slime, uh, slums, uh, pollutions and congestions. Meanwhile, cities may be also constrained to exploit the advantages of urbanization due to lack of competitiveness, as evidenced by slow business instructions, poor telecommunications, infrastructure, in expensive electricity, unreliable water services, traffic issues, and weak innovation. The climate change and COVID-19 pandemic made the situation even more challenging for cities to thrive given the pandemic effects on people and businesses. These challenges require innovate, innovative solutions, one of which could be smart city development. According to various literature, smart city initiatives can lead to innovation, sustainability, efficiency, competitiveness, inclusiveness, and economic growth. Moreover, these qualities enhance the quality of life, uh, resilience, and governance. This afternoon, we will feature the PIDS study on read the readiness of the Philippine uh, cities to smart city development, authored by PID Supervising Research Specialist Tatum Ram Ramos, Senior Vice, uh, Senior uh, Research Specialist Pauline Joim Lorenzo, Research Specialist Jenica Ancheta, and our Vice President Mar Marifi Balesteros. The study examined whether the Philippine cities are ready for smart city development. It also identified significant challenges that need to be addressed at the national and local levels. The presenter, Ms. Statum Ramos, will share the state of, uh, state of the smart city development among Philippine cities. She will also provide recommendations on how the government can facilitate the development of smart cities in the country. To enrich our discussions, we invited key persons involved in the different aspects of smart city development. First, we have Mayor Bernardo T. Faustino D, Bernard Faustino D of Kawayan Isabela, Kawayan City Isabela. We will discuss the LGO's experience in implementing the smart city initiatives. We also have Executive Director Enrico Paringit of the Department of Science and Technology Philippine Council for Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technology Research and Development to talk about their efforts to promote sustainable smart cities in the country. Finally, we have Attorney Rainier. Anthony Milanis, Chief of the uh, Compliance and Monitoring Division with National Privacy Commission's Data Security and Compliance Office, who will share uh, the NPC's uh, initiative to address uh, smart city development concerns, particularly uh, data privacy and protection. It is an honor for PIDS to have you, uh, all of you, at this event and hear your insights on the topic. I encourage uh, everyone to stay until the end of the webinar and actively participate in the open forum. Thank you, and I'll give up the floor to the moderator. And thank you very much, um, Dr. Urbeta, for setting the tone of our webinar for uh, this week. Um, I was looking at our uh, uh, participants uh, list, and we have more than 400 participants on WebEx and nearly uh, 50 um, on Facebook. So this just shows the uh, strong interest um, in the topic of smart cities. Okay. Um, so friends, we don't want to keep you waiting. So at this point, let us listen to our featured presentation, which as mentioned by uh, Dr. Orbeta, is uh, 
is the PIDS study authored by Tatum Ramos, uh, Joy uh, Lorenzo, Jenny Cancheta, and Dr. Marife Ballesteros. The presentation will be uh, delivered by uh, Ms. Ramos, who is a supervising research specialist at PIDS. Uh, Tatum earned her master's degree in public policy with specialization in management and leadership from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, and her bachelor's degree in economics from the University of the Philippines School of Economics. Her research area is urban development, and she has co-authored publications on housing. Tatum, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Uh, I think I am not... Oh, okay. I can share now. All right. All right, uh, just to reiterate, um, this study has been conducted with um, Ms. Pauline Joy Lorenzo, Ms. Jenica Ancheta, and Dr. Marife Ballesteros. Uh, so um, this study was conducted uh, because uh, the potential of smart city to address urbanization challenges has been recognized now more than ever. And we've also seen some stakeholders um, using the term smart city to evoke some sort of ut a utopia, uh, a local sphere where there are numerous positive developments uh, that are associated with uh, numerous benefits to constituents. Uh, so before actually we can draw a line though um, between the smart city initiatives and, and the intended outcomes of it, um, we still have to establish the revenues of Philippine cities to smart city development. And we think that the, this can be pinned down by answering three main policy questions. First, what drives Philippine LGUs towards the implementation of smart city initiatives? Second, what is the extent of smart city development among Philippine cities? And third, how can the Philippine government facilitate the development of smart cities? So we tried answering these questions by first conducting a desk review on the smart city concept. We also looked at discussions on enablers, barriers, and pathways. Uh, we also looked at uh, international cases and we provided an overview of smart city initiatives in the Philippines. And then we centered on in um, specific Philippine cases. So um, we also conducted interviews with five national government agencies, six local government units, four development organizations, and seven businesses. Uh, based on uh, the, the review that we conducted um, using online resources on the initiatives of smart cities uh, or, or, or the initiatives of um, LGUs and cities in, towards smart city development, um, we were able to select six cities. So um, we were also able to identify initially um, what what are the cities that have high level of implementation? And these were identified to be Mandawa City, San Fernando City, and Kauaian City. And we also uh, added other um, cities to enrich the assessment. So that includes Malabon City, Tagum City, and Tugigirao City. Um, out of the six sites, um, we, we, uh, we should take note that two are highly urbanized and of the first income class having around 350,000 plus population, uh, that's Mandawe and Malabon. We also have uh, San Fernando City and Tagum City, which are not highly urbanized, but of the first income class, having around 300,000 population. And we have Kauaian City and Tugigirao City, which are not highly urbanized um, and of the third income class, having around um, 150,000 population. Uh, before we conducted the interviews, we, want, we, we wanted to establish within the research team what is a smart city. Um, so um, we conducted the review of literature and came across the ASEAN Smart Cities Framework, um, which provides us uh, with a definition of a smart city and emphasizes that it can harness technological and digital solutions as well as innovative non-technological means. 
we also came across the DOST framework for smart, sustainable communities and cities, which emphasizes the characteristic of a smart city uh, as an ecosystem comprised of people, organizations, and businesses, policies, laws, and processes. Uh, last but not the least, we have um, uh, a Philippine national standard that's actually patterned from an, the ISO 37122 on smart city indicators. Um, and some of the themes that are present here are um, treating sustainability as an outcome of a, of a smart city and the use of data information and modern technologies. So um, um, with all the definitions that we came across um, during the review of the literature, um, we, we wanted for this particular um, study to formulate a working definition that would facilitate our assessment of whether Philippine cities are, are ready for smart city development. And um, so um, this definition, well, a smart city is defined here as a technology and innovation powered system that senses, monitors, processes, translates and communicates civic and social, health and well-being, safety and security, quality environment, built infrastructure, and industry and innovation data, information and knowledge by, from, or to people and institutions for high quality of life, competitive economy, and sustainable environment. And from the interviewees themselves, we were able to derive some keywords that are associated with what a smart city is. So these include development, sustainable, digital, quality, efficient, right, uh, safe, national, intelligent, and local. And um, uh, in this table and the succeeding tables, you will find um, the initiatives or summary of initiatives that are based on documents from interviewees as well as online resources. So I won't go through each of these initiatives in the interest of time, but I will um, provide um, some or, or release some of the initiatives to give you an insight of on the extent of smart city in initiatives in the Philippines or smart city development in the Philippines. So for Mandawa City, we have for um, uh, safety and security, the Guardian Emergency Response System. We also have in line with um, the quality environment domain, the low carbon city. For San Fernando City, we have um, for quality environment, solar panels. We, we also have for civic and social initiatives, the online business transactions. For Kauaian City, there are initiatives related to mobility like the e-trikes and the e-scooter. They also have um, for safety and security, the police drones and um, the digital twin. And they have for health and well-being, the RX box and the Kauaian City Care COVID-19 consult. Now, for the other cities um, that were not necessarily um, uh, recognized as having high level of implementation ba based on the initial review, um, we, we noted that they, they do have uh, quite a number of initiatives also. So um, for Malabon, they have for built infrastructure, the installation of uh, internet connectivity. They also have for uh, civic and social initiatives, the online payment services system. For Tagum City, they have for civic and social initiatives, the revenue administration and mobilization program. And they have for um, built infrastructure, um, the installation of uh, an internet tower. And um, lastly, for Tugigarao City, we have, um, uh, they have um, for basic infrastructure, the installation of a direct internet, and they also have um, civic and social initiatives like the Tugigarao government portal. Uh, now, um, it's also important to emphasize that the, the initiatives that are being implemented in, in the Philippines are also being supported by initiatives at the national level. So the World Bank actually divides the smart city development phases into three. So that's infrastructure, data, and service. 
And for each of these phases, um, there are initiatives also coming from the national government agencies. So, for example, we have under the infrastructure phase, um, we have um, from the DOST, uh, they've been issuing calls for proposals such as on the convergence of emerging technologies or sectors towards Industry 4.0 and smarter cities and communities in the Philippines. Uh, the DICT has also been uh, implementing the National Broadband Program, the Free Wi-Fi for All Project, and also the Digital Cities Program. Under the data phase, um, we have the NPC implementing um, the Data Privacy Act, uh, and these include the monitoring of statistics on bre breach notifications, as well as the issuance of advisory opinions. We also have the Freedom of Information program being implemented by the PCOO and um, the DICT and the PSA um, having their um, open data platforms like for the DICT, they have the Open Data Philippines and for the PSA, they've been um, managing the open stat. Uh, the DOSTP Shirt has also been implementing uh, capacity building programs to help in smart city development. And these include the Smarter Philippines through Data Analytics Research and Development Training and Adoption, or SPARTA, that's being implemented with the DAP and also the PCOO. They, the DOSTP Shirt has also been implementing the Goddess Program, or the Good Governance through Data Science and Decision Support System Program. Uh, this also helps in, in the financing of capstone projects of graduates from uh, the SPARTA program. While for um, the service phase, um, well, we know that um, uh, the Philippines has been implementing the Ease of Doing Business and Efficient Government Service Delivery Act of 2018. So moving on to um, the interview findings, um, we actually saw um, some some insights on motivations, enablers, uh, pathways, and challenges. And for motivations, um, LGUs recognize that they've been motivated to implement smart, smart city initiatives because of, uh, well, they need to address the needs of constituents and they also need to uphold the policy on ease of doing business. For businesses, they've been supporting the smart city development um, and some of the initiatives are even part of their corporate social responsibility activities. And some even noted that what's good for the people or the city is good for the business. Also, we have um, development organizations and NGAs saying that um, they've been supporting smart city development because the smart city agenda is in line with um, their objectives and mandates. So some of um, these are, are um, connected to the desire to, to contribute to the attainment of sustainable development goals. Under enablers, we have LGUs noting, LGUs and the private sector noting that um, smart city champions are facilitators of smart city development. In addition, LGUs and the NGAs um, said that uh, ICT personnel have to be in place um, in order for, um, for smart city development to happen. Um, the LGUs also point out the need for basic ICT infrastructure and technical and funding support. And uh, while the private sector and the NGAs emphasize that there should be digitized data available from coming from the LGUs. Um, a common enabler that's been identified by all um, stakeholder groups are partnerships. Uh, in, in addition, um, we've noted some findings on challenges and the LGUs um, noted that um, a major obstacle in smart city development or the implementation of smart city initiatives is the lack of funding. And this is in line with their um, insight on the COVID-19 pandemic also being an obstacle. Some LGUs noted um, or relayed that um, uh, they would rather invest, uh, they would rather um, put their funds in social assistance programs in, instead of investing in um, smart city initiatives currently given the pandemic. Um, also, um, 
the, the LGUs noted that there's lack of policies, lack of uh, interoperability, and there's low public up uptake. For the low public uptake, the LGUs noted that um, this is actually uh, a result of of the the need or the need of constituents as well as LGU personnel to adapt to modern technologies. Um, and they, but they said that this is a manageable issue. Uh, however, pri the private sector and the NGAs um, have noted that the low public uptake is because it's more because of um, the the hesitation due to um, data security issues. Uh, the private sector and the NGAs also noted that there are issues on data cleaning and merging. Now, um, for pathways, um, LGUs and the private sector have um, specified that there a good pathway would be to implement or to have partnerships with formalized agreements. So these include um, MOAs as well as ordinances and resolutions. Uh, LGUs and the private sector also noted that pilot projects are um, good pathways for the LGUs. Um, they say they say that they benefit from this because they in in implementing these pilot projects, they it enables them to determine which are the projects that should be prioritized in the long run. Uh, also, uh, for the private sector, um, pilot projects are important because this enables them to market um, their products and or services as well as to test it even further. Um, also, LGUs and NGAs have emphasized the need to have capacity building activities uh, to facilitate smart city development. Now, um, given all those findings, we want to conclude with by answering the three main policy questions that we've posed earlier. So first, what drives Philippine LGUs towards the implementation of smart city initiatives? And we've seen that the motivations are actually consistent with the three outcomes in the working definition. And those are high quality of life, competitive economy, and sustainable environment. We also see as enablers the presence of smart city champions, ICT personnel and infrastructure, and digitized data, as well as government policies and stakeholder engagement. Uh, on the question of, of what is the extent of smart city development among Philippine cities, we see more initiatives in the infrastructure phase, but for those with high level of implementation, we notice that they have initiatives in each of the development phases. So that's infrastructure, data, and service. For focus, um, uh, the domains that are being concentrated upon by the stakeholders include um, built infrastructure and civic and social domains. But for those with high level of implementation, they've been venturing into some other domains like quality environment. And then um, there are, we, we take note that there are generally more initiatives involving institutions and data information while people and knowledge fall short in their respective categories of stakeholders and semiotics. Also, um, we would like to emphasize that the smart city initiatives are being supported by some national government efforts as those that have been identified earlier. But then again, um, we, uh, we still see that there are numerous challenges, including those related to funding, interoperability of data systems, public uptake, and sustainability. And we also think that the solutions would be best carried out with the help of the national government. And we would like to emphasize here that LGUs cannot be left paddling their own canoe towards smart city development. So on that note, um, we wanted to provide the recommendations on how the Philippine government can facilitate the development of smart cities by distinguishing the, the recommended steps between what the national government can do and what the local government units can do. So first, we would recommend a consistent branding on technology and innovation-powered Philippine cities. 
we notice uh, through the interviews that um, some stakeholders use uh, the stakeholders use various terms like digital city, intelligent city, as well as smart city. Um, but we've seen in um, the the experiences or what what other in, what international cities have been doing that they've been uh, concentrating more on smart cities, especially those that are uh, on the top um, rankings of of the smart city index. Uh, for example, Abu Dhabi has um, converted their Masdar City project from an eco-centered one into a smart city one. Uh, so for the Philippines, we would like to recommend that the DOST be sure it become the lead agency because of the relevance of its mandate to the smart city agenda, as well as its um, experience in engaging um, smart city stakeholders. And we also recommend that they explore assessing LGUs to be engaged in terms of potential indicators of readiness. So these indicators can include the presence of smart city champions, the presence of ICT personnel, number of completed projects supported by formalized agreements, the number of constituents with internet access, as well as the availability of digitized data. These suggested indicators were patterned from the findings of the study uh, on, on the enablers as well as on the pathways. And we also recommend the LGUs to consider monitoring readiness based on these suggested indicators. We would also recommend the DILG to support in the promotion of the references at the local level. So um, we, um, we, we take note that um, there are already local references like the PNS, ISO 37122, as well as the DOST framework for smart, sustainable communities and cities. But um, with our interviews, uh, we noted um, and and we we noted that um, the the stakeholders not mo not many of the stakeholders are actually using these as references. Um, also, we would recommend the PPP sense center to provide guidance in the conduct of feasibility studies involving smart city related PPP projects. Uh, the PPP center has actually been um, conducting feasibility studies already um, uh, that are in line with smart city development. Um, but then um, we, we in, in international cities, we, we, note, we noted that um, they've uh, recognized the 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 PPP mode as a major source or a major mode of implementation of smart city initiatives. While for the Philippines, uh, LGUs have been sourcing their funds more from the internal budget as well as from loans. So we would recommend LGUs to explore um, the PPP mode more. A uh, second recommendation is um, the development of policies and standards to improve data flow. We would like to emphasize that uh, a smart city or an aspiring smart city does not necessarily need to have a single platform or application for all of their um, initiatives. But uh, this is because, of course, um, technology changes over time and there are improvements over time. Um, but we do recommend having at least a common uh, data repository and good application programming interfaces that would enable good communication among the applications that they have. So we think that the DACT and the NPC can issue policies and standards on uh, that are related to this, and also the LGUs can designate ICT personnel that would focus on interoperability and security of data systems. Third, we recommend the incorporation of transparency and accountability measures in the implementation of initiatives. Actually, the DOST preferred already incorporated the transparency principle in, in the DOST framework. Um, however, we would still like to see uh, an emphasis on the accountability principle. This is, um, of course, because um, a, a smart city actually, um, uh, we, we, we expect constituents or the public uh, of, of aspiring smart cities to 
eventually demand more involvement in in monitor in the monitoring of the progress of projects uh, and this as uh, smart cities uh, capable of doing this and so we we would like to recommend LGUs to ex further explore data sharing to the public uh, we take note that um, uh, in the interviews we the stakeholders would would normally uh, relay the, uh, the collection of data from the public, but there's a lack of um, initiatives that are actually uh, sharing the data to the public. And also, um, we, we recommend the DALG to monitor the adoption of the framework, the DOSC framework, and assess development based on indicators from the PNS and implement accreditation and accreditation system accordingly. Uh, of course, we, we also um, recommend LGUs to monitor relevant efforts using the framework and the PNS. So those are our recommendations for um, uh, that are um, that are based on the findings of the study. Uh, we welcome um, uh, comments from our audience as well as from the discussants. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tatum Ramos, for um, your clear and comprehensive presentation. So friends, um, if you have questions, just use our chat box. And uh, for those who are watching us on Facebook, you may use the comment section. And uh, during the open forum, we will enter it in all your questions during the open forum. OK, so at this point, let us continue the conversation. And this time, we will hear from three officials will give their comments and insights on the presentation. And our first uh, discussion is the local uh, chief executive of the city of uh, Kauaian, uh, which um, was mentioned by, uh, um, by uh, Tatum as one of the leading uh, cities in the country in terms of uh, smart city development, despite being a third income class LGU and not a highly urbanized city. Our invited speaker will share with us the journey of his city in implementing smart city initiatives and um, the lessons that they have learned from uh, their experience. Mayor uh, Bernard Faustino D. of the City of Kauaian has received numerous awards, uh, including Most Outstanding Mayor and one of the 10 Outstanding Young Men of the Philippines. As an advocate of digital governance, his leadership brought Kauaian City to the limelight for being recognized in 2015 as the first uh, smart um, as the first smart city in the country. His active advocacy of, of localizing the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals has enabled Kauaian City to assert its presence in the national international arena as an evolving, um, smarter and sustainable city. Friends, I now give you Mayor. Bernard D. Sir, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Sheila, uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, first and foremost, allow me to express my utmost appreciation to PIDS, uh, of course, to uh, its president, Dr. Uh, uh, Ancierto Orbeta, and of course, to Ms. Tatum, Tatum Ramos, who, who I think he is doing a brilliant um, endeavor on really um, highlighting the need. It's actually a need for the Philippines to go, uh, Philippine cities to to use a smart city framework. I think it's high time that we already evolve as smart cities. Um, uh, if I would like to ask for your indulgence that I will not present our journey at the, uh, as of this time uh, because I was asked to, to um, uh, comment and uh, discuss on on the pending um, on the on the research of Ms. Tatum Rama. So I would like to uh, again uh, start by saying that um, it's high time already that we discuss smart cities uh, in all over, in all our cities in the Philippines. Uh, in fact, uh, it's long overdue uh, when we started our smart cities um, uh, journey back in 2013, 2014. Uh, when you talk about smart smart cities, uh, people will just ask, "Oi, is that the CCTV? As long as you have a CCTV." command center, smart city na, but that has not been the case. Um, um, 
um, a lot of cities, uh, especially now with the onslaught or with the aftermath of the uh, pandemic, uh, everything is going digital. Uh, there's digital economy, digital governance, digital education. So a lot of our LGUs are not anymore um, just smart city driven, but are, they're already in the second phase, which is the smart city enabled. And a lot of them maybe just don't know it yet that they're already a smart city. So I think the understanding of the local chief executives as well as down the line uh, to the department heads, to the employees, to, to every stakeholder in the city plays an important factor, important role on uh, understanding the smart cities. Um, I think um, one of the main um, takeaways here is that um, um, we it has not been discussed briefly by the national government uh, and I think after this uh, after this uh, presentation of uh, Ms. Tatum, after this um, um, endeavor, I think the more the more that we will get and understand what smart cities are. There's really no exact and one definition of smart cities. Uh, if you if you if you read all the references, if you uh, ask the different uh, uh, smart cities uh, um, networks, smart cities um, associations, they all have different different um, descriptions but what's important is that um, it's it's using use using information and communications technology to improve uh, the quality of life of people and to provide better uh, and more efficient public uh, service so I think in that way um, I think all of us will be will will have a will have a sort of the same the same um, insight that uh, when you talk about smart cities it's it's there to help to help uh, not just the constituents, but also in governance, in delivering uh, services, in delivering, delivering um, um, uh, whether it be public or private uh, services, it's just making lives more convenient. Um, so with that, I would like to add um, uh, as my reaction um, to, to Ms. Tatum's uh, uh, research, uh, when, when there was a mention on, on our side, on the initiatives of this, uh, on the journey of Kauai City on uh, more initiatives in the infrastructure phase. Uh, this is something that I wanted to tackle because um, this has been our experience also. That now we learn to start with uh, uh, the first step, which is um, uh, more initiatives uh, on dialogues with people and learn and understand the challenges of the people. Um, we've, we've, it's like a sort of bottom-up approach. Uh, we view this approach to be more effective and impactful. Uh, smart city is not just about putting technologies just for the sake of having said that you have a new technology and then you use it and there's a smart city already, but smart city is more on using technology to address the problems of the people with the aim to improve the quality of life. Uh, this is one of the ex our experiences. There were a lot of technologies that we um, um, uh, rolled out uh, back in 2014, 2015 that, you know, it was really nice, but unfortunately, it did not relate to the people. It did not relate to the citizens. So uh, I think what's important there is as long as, uh, you know, they can use it, they can, they can uh, accept it and absorb it. And I think that will make it more effective. So we've learned our lesson from there. So now we really have to engage the citizens, the problems of, um, you know, uh, the citizens so that we try to find solutions on how to address the current problems that come from them. Um, next will be the recommendations that was earlier mentioned by um, uh, Ms. Tatum uh, on the development of policies and standards to improve the data flow. Um, I think my reaction uh, would be uh, that's good, but the development of polic policies to improve should have to include or should also include to protect uh, the usage of data. Uh, cybersecurity now is um, very much um, 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 important, uh, especially you know, um, you 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 hear of stories that their their online banking, were, you know, all their money were were was their online banking was hacked and all their money were taken away for for you know overnight in the alam. So I think this is very important. This is a very important issue that uh, we protect the, the data because you know now data is the new oil, and if we just uh, uh, you know give it to everyone, it's going to be very very uh, dangerous. Next will be the national and local can include international partners as enablers or stakeholders as well to take advantage of the members. So, uh, so take advantage of membership in different international organizations involved in smart cities because there are a lot already, a lot of organizations, a lot of associations of cities uh, that uh, have come together because they can also help in funding support and technical assistance as well. 
And, and next is, um, aside from transparency and accountability measures in implementing smart cities initiatives, there must also be measures on impact assessment or KPIs uh, to evaluate the implementation of smart city initiatives. And uh, just to uh, add on that, um, um, the, as mentioned by uh, Ms. Tatum Ramos, the ISO 37122 is, is a good KPI, is a good uh, um, tool to use, to use, but unfortunately it's new. Uh, but now we're proud to say that Kauaian City, where we just uh, ended our second uh, party audit on ISO 37122, hoping that we can uh, uh, get our accreditation by uh, uh, April or May uh, so that we can be ISO certified on smart, sustainable cities. Um, I think uh, these are tools that uh, I think would guide our local government uh, units. And one of the suggestions also or takeaways is that Hopefully, with the involvement of the national agencies such as DILG in this uh, uh, endeavor, they could include uh, the Smart Cities Framework or KPIs in the seal of good local governance. This will give a big push on LGUs to, to, to really um, um, embrace uh, the Smart City Framework. And finally, uh, I just want to report that on uh, March 25, we'll be launching our uh, Sustainable Development Center or SDG Center, which also happens and coincides with our Smart City Day. On March, every March 25, we're holding a Mar Smart City Day. So these are things that uh, that uh, we we invite um, different stakeholders, different partners uh, from the local and national level, and even international, to have a common ground for the sh for sharing for sharing of best practices, uh, uh, sharing of smart solutions. On that day, we'll have a smart city um, hackathon uh, to, to, to provide and find uh, solutions, sustainable solutions to the problems of different LGU. So these are things that, uh, 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 these are our contributions, our small contributions in the smart city uh, approach. So yeah, I guess uh, for now, that's my, that's my sharing. Uh, sorry for talking too much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor D. So we will hear more from you during the open forum. I saw some questions already in the chat box, and uh, some of them are uh, addressed to you. So, uh, okay, friends, um, moving on. Okay, so one of the key government um, agencies uh, mentioned by our uh, presenter that plays an important role in pushing uh, the Smart City Agenda Forward is the Philippine Council for Industry, Energy, and um, Emerging Research and Development, or PSHERD, which is one of the councils under the Department of Science and Technology. And with us today is none other than its head, uh, Executive Director Enrico Parinit. Before joining PSHERD, um, E.D. Parinit, who is an engineer, shared his expertise for 23 years with the Department of Geodetic Engineering, College of Engineering of the, of the Uni, uh, University of the Philippines, Suleiman, as a researcher, uh, fellow research affiliate, teaching uh, member of the teaching faculty, department chair, and professorial uh, chair. An outstanding engineer, he led game-changing programs and projects in land surveying, remote sensing, and geographic information system, environmental monitoring, and disaster risk assessment and management. And one of these is a disaster risk assessment, exposure and mitigation, light ranging and detection technology, or DREAM LIDAR, which was recognized as the biggest single project that a research unit in the entire UP system has ever undertaken. Um, this project assessed and helped mitigate the effects of flooding disasters in the country by producing accurate national um, terrain elevation maps and uh, training highly skilled LIDAR and uh, flood mapping experts all over the country. Let us all welcome Executive Director Enrico Paringit of the OST Sure, Sir, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, of course, I'd like to greet everyone a pleasant uh, good afternoon, uh, especially, of course, uh, our, uh, the, you know, the, the ones spearheading this uh, forum. Of course, uh, we've heard from uh, Dr. Orbeta earlier, and of course, the, uh, the the leader for this uh, this uh, study on uh, uh, the, the smart cities, no? uh, Tatum, uh, who has uh, wonderfully uh, presented uh, all of the um, the current initiatives, the movement, no, because I I really consider this smart city to be a movement uh, in this case, 
Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we've heard from uh, uh, also from Mayor uh, Bernard D on his uh, insights from uh, years of experience in uh, uh, making a uh, really uh, or building a uh, smart city no, from uh, from scratch. Uh, it's a living testimony on uh, how smart cities so should uh, actually be uh, built. Um, um, I'd, I'd like to draw on some uh, key insights no, on the, um, uh, the study that had been uh, presented. One is that, of course, I'd like to commend uh, the team that uh, made this uh, happen. Uh, there are particularly many uh, directions there that uh, really uh, local government units, uh, particularly those uh, budding smart cities, may uh, opt to uh, pursue no, as a matter of uh, course no, when they want to develop their own version of smart city. So that being said, uh, I, I subscribe and I uh, agree with uh, what uh, Mayor Bernard uh, earlier said that uh, uh, you are your own smart city. You know, as um, uh, each each one as as each LGU actually assumes uh, its own identity uh, because you know it has its own unique of uh, characteristics as a uh, as a city. Uh, it has its own set of. Uh, uh, when I say characteristics, its own set of resources, uh, its own state of uh, development, uh, perhaps. And then number three, also, it has its own, um, um, it has its own um, uh, sets of aspirations as a uh, city. No? Uh, each, of, each, each of us, has, uh, we, are, we have our own vision of what we want to become uh, as a city. And uh, of course, uh, in all of these uh, pursuits for development as, as being smart, there are many tools, technologies, uh, applications that uh, a city would use. And sometimes they're actually um, uh, the common, we could say common denominator. Now, the tools of the trade are quite uh, uh, quite accessible no? nowadays, no? especially with all of these uh, um, uh, smart city related technologies that uh, are being tapped. Now, of course, uh, CCTV cameras, command centers, uh, ubiquitous sensors that are being uh, installed all around, uh, citizen engagement, social media. Uh, there are common platforms and, and, and tools that we can actually use in order to get the pulse of the people and also inform people about the way we do things. Uh, and these are also linked to the different services that we have uh, in place. No? And um, going back to that idea earlier that uh, all of the cities are... Uh, smart in their own way. Therefore, uh, the directions, the priorities, and the actions to be taken by each of these cities are uh, quite different. No? Um, so that um, moving forward, they need to identify actually what their priorities are according to uh, those aspirations. No? So, so they should also identify the kinds of technologies that will help them uh, move uh, or accelerate further into their uh, Process of uh, smart food, if I may, uh, uh, if I may uh, use that term, no. In the same manner, if you've uh, read, there are many forms of uh, what they call multiple intelligence, no. And there are many forms also of being uh, smart. And uh, being smart is uh, actually being able to uh, have all the uh, the technologies available to support your uh, development goals, no. And uh, that's that's actually one of the things that we should uh, pursue. Uh, before, of course, all of these things are being pursued independently of each other, there must be some kind of, uh, uh, of tying up that uh, needs to be done at different we lost the So that's when the uh, aspects of interoperability and um, uh, st standards come in. When I say standards and uh, interoperability, do not, they do not necessarily connote that uh, everything should be uniform in the same manner that uh, each uh, city is uh, unique in its own way, right? So uh, we just need to talk about uh, things that we could collect uh, uh, as data, uh, in, as, uh, as common uh, parameters that we can uh, submit and uh, send to uh, uh, government authorities interoperable in the sense that we need, then we need to exchange information among and between uh, uh, local government units as well as from different uh, levels of governance. Uh, it's readily uh, exchangeable at uh, these different levels for aggregation and disaggregation. And the third is uh, trying to make all of this data functional at that level. 
there's actually no point in sometimes collecting the very uh, detailed data coming in from the barangay when it uh, all we need are actually uh, details that are enough for us to plan and uh, prepare for some um, uh, activities or some uh, uh, development pursuits at the higher level. So uh, those are the, some of the uh, directions that we need to take if ever we wanted to also pursue this smartly. No? Um, uh, because data can be actually be overwhelming. Uh, that said, uh, I also wish to uh, wish to, of course, uh, we're, we're quite flattered with the suggestion that the USD take the lead role in uh, uh, no, making sure that these technologies are uh, present for any uh, smart city to be uh, uh, tapping into. Uh, because there, I, I think in the future, in the near future, even now, there will be a proliferation of smart city technologies, well, touted as smart city technologies, and they need to be also tied up with uh, some kind of uh, standardization no? or uh, interoperability so that uh, there will be easy access. No, it's, it, it should be as easy as uh, using your, uh, you know, your word processor or your spreadsheet so that in the event that you will use them in different platforms, different software, different uh, um, uh, different versions, they can uh, be exchanged, they can be uh, uh, they can be processed uh, with the same ease and uh, confidence as uh, the others, uh, the other tools that are available out there. Uh, especially now that uh, even the smart city technologies are even coming in from different uh, parts of the uh, parts of the world, no, moving into uh, our area. So in the same uh, maybe token that internationalization needs to be pursued, like for example, exploring. Uh, uh, well, we have this concept before twin cities, no, but uh, now we're talking about digital twin cities, no, uh, meeting your virtual uh, city, um, and at the same time also trying to look at uh, parallels between what other cities are pursuing as matters of smart city development. So, uh, but the tools and the, you know, the tools and the technologies could be the same, actually could be similar, but they need to be uh, put into context, no? according to the practices, according to the cultures, according to the conventions that we have uh, been using here in the Philippines. No? It's like, you know, it's like your right hand versus left hand uh, uh, driven roads, for example. Uh, how could you apply it when your systems for, uh, uh, for example, for using um, uh, uh, traffic lights no, are of, uh, the, in a different uh, uh, applied in a different lane. No? So, so things like that, no? that, need, that also needs to be uh, contextualized. Uh, lastly, of course, um, um, uh, we, uh, we take note of the, uh, the, the greater role that accountability um, uh, on uh, principle, which actually requires us to uh, take responsibility for you know, the, some of the, da the data that's going to be obtained from uh, the citizens. No? Some of these are actually very sensitive, some are personal, and we have to make sure that uh, there's a high degree of confidence that this will not be uh, misused. And so that's when the concept also of, uh, uh, of, um, of uh, digital sandboxes needs to be uh, pursued. Uh, it means, well, digital sandboxes are essentially small uh, versions of the applications or of the uh, tools that, uh, digital tools that were um, uh, coming out uh, or developing for smart cities, but they need to be uh, tested in a uh, controlled environment so that uh, any problems or any uh, issues or concerns that we have uh, in them can be immediately addressed before they get actually deployed. So this might actually answer some of the questions about uh, data integrity, security, uh, and privacy no? in, in uh, some of the uh, smart, uh, uh, smart city concerns that we're uh, trying to also address. Lastly, of course, I'd like to everyone to still uh, partner with us no? at the BUSD Fisher to continue partnering with us as we uh, pursue or um, uh, find uh, other solutions. No? We're, uh, I've always been saying that we need to uh, complete our e uh, electronic or e uh, digital uh, uh, city hall no so that means trying to find a digital solution for all the services that we usually find in a uh, city hall so that actually uh, people in the city hall could could actually be more engaged with the cities by actually being with them uh, on the ground no uh, so with, with that i think uh, I, I can end here and uh, invite everyone because we still have a call for smart uh, city uh,
projects. We have now, uh, I think, total of four uh, smart city pilot uh, projects that we're looking at. On top of that, we're also supporting a lot of uh, projects on data science and uh, decision making uh, uh, using, uh, of course, uh, uh, cities as a key uh, platforms for deployment. So with that, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to share uh, to share our uh, thoughts on the uh, study and uh, congratulate the team for uh, producing this uh, very uh, uh, um, authoritative document, which I think everyone will be using in the coming uh, in the coming years to come. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Ed Enrico Parinis of uh, Pichard. We uh, very much appreciate, sir, your insightful remarks. So, okay, friends, we now have come to our final uh, reactor. And uh, this time uh, we'll um, talk about, you know, data privacy, which is an important aspect that needs to be um, upheld and protected in the development of smart cities. And as such, um, security standards should be in place to safeguard citizens' data. And uh, with us today, to share the privacy data privacy initiatives of his office, which is the National Privacy Commission or NPC, is Attorney Rainier Anthony Milanes, who's the Chief of the Compliance and Monitoring Division of the Data Security and Compliance Office of NPC. Before joining the Commission, Attorney Milanes was the Legal and Data Protection Officer of a startup security and tech solutions provider with partnerships within the European Union and Israel. He also previously served as corporate secretary of an agribusiness company and an instructor in business law, the Colegio de San Juan de Letran. He also served as the director of operations and concurrent head of legal and compliance of a private uh, real estate and leasing company. He is a member of the International Association of Private Professionals and a certified information privacy manager. I now give you attorney Anthony Milanes of uh, the National Privacy Commission. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Sheila, for that uh, introduction. Uh, and also to the proponents of this uh, webinar, thank you very much for inviting the National Privacy Commission and giving us an opportunity to uh, share uh, our insights and our reaction to uh, this topic on smart cities. So, um, privacy and data protection in smart cities. Uh, a smart city aims at the effective integration of physical, digital, and human systems in a built envir environment to deliver sustainable, pros prosperous, and inclusive future for its citizens. Uh, now that many smart systems have been implemented, security and privacy issues have become a major challenge that requires effective countermeasures. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity you know, to appeal that we erase the misconception that the Data Privacy Act or the National Privacy Commission as your privacy regulator is a speed bump or if not a roadblock to innovation in digital change. Uh, as we always uh, say in our advocacy, uh, sh we always support innovation. We always support data privacy with innovation, data privacy with technological change. Working with your privacy regulator is the next step in sustaining a strong implementation of technology, technology in smart cities. Adherence to the data privacy principle shows accountability and this builds trust. Trust of data subjects is paramount to gain support. Support by all constituents is essential in sustaining smart cities. The commission through the leadership of attorney John Henry Dunaga commits to work in building trust among data subjects, support and promote projects of local governments who uphold data subject rights. The commission starting this year will strengthen privacy compliance and privacy compliance programs to steer cities and municipalities towards a data privacy compliant and accountable arena. It is necessary to be aware of security and privacy threats when designing and implementing new mechanisms or systems. The Commission stresses the importance of privacy by design or privacy by default approach, specifically in the development of data processing systems. Uh, let me delve into you know, a bit 
uh, uh, please allow me to delve into a bit in this privacy by design and privacy by default approach. The goal of the privacy by design is to make privacy protection a priority equal to priorities such as developing new technological innovations. The privacy by design framework has uh, seven basic principles that reflect the idea that privacy protection should form part of the initial project development and not become a consideration after a personal data breach has already occurred. So the, uh, the first um, fundamental principle in uh, privacy by design is that privacy must be proactive and not reactive. So a privacy, uh, it should be preventative rather, rather than remedial. We need to anticipate and prevent events that violate personal data privacy. We need to identify the systems that do a poor job in protecting privacy and take steps to correct them. This principle reflects a high level of commitment to privacy and the establishment of ways to in integrate privacy concerns into new projects. A second principle is the privacy must be the default setting. Systems should automatically protect privacy even if the user does nothing. So for example, you, you should create a user interface settings that are automatically set to the highest privacy level and as default in collecting uh, personal or sensitive personal information. Um, a third, the third principle is uh, privacy must be embedded into the design. So privacy should form part of a system's architecture. Uh, this principle basically says that uh, privacy is not sacrificed in order to you know, reach uh, different means or different goals. A fourth the fourth principle is privacy integrations must offer full functionality and be positive sum and not zero sum. So accommodate functionality in a privacy setup, which is a win-win manner. You sh users should never uh, have to make a choice uh, between using a system or their privacy. They should have full access to the features without having to give up more of their personal or sensitive personal information. The fifth principle is systems must offer end-to-end -end security and full life cycle protection. So full life cycle protection means you must act responsibly from the full the for the entire time you're interacting with the user data from, act from the acquisition to processing to storage, even to uh, sharing with third parties if you if the purpose of your collection is sharing with other parties now we go on to number the number six principle uh, privacy standards must offer visibility and transparency so smart cities must be open and accountable about how you use personal information uh, you provide a privacy policy and a privacy notice to users so that they can check you know and you give the account, uh, sorry, you give the contact details of your data protection officer so that if these um, data subjects would want to raise issues or would want to exercise their data subject rights, they will be able to find, easily find that, that uh, uh, person who will be able to help them. Last but not the least, uh, in, uh, as I mentioned, it's seven. So the seventh uh, principle in... Uh, Privacy by design is systems must prioritize ever ev, ev, everything must prioritize user privacy. So always keep the privacy interest and of your users in mind. Ask for consent from the users if needed. Give out notices. Um, uh, spell out your privacy policy. Spell out your privacy statement and remain open and accountable. The creation of these smart applications may also pose numerous security and privacy problems due to the vulnerabilities commonly existing in each layer of a smart system. It is very important that our LGUs or uh, our personal information controllers within the smart city who are, in, uh, who are processing personal information or in the process or is focused in building these technology-driven cities ensure the protection of personal and sensitive personal information that they process. Now, uh, I'll give you three steps to compliance. No? The first step is to create through local legislation 
an office or a department focused in ensuring data privacy and information security. The LGU's privacy team will be headed by a data protection officer. Registration of the data protection officer and data processing systems with the National Privacy Commission is required by law. Second is for the LGU through its created office implement a privacy management program where there is a regular conduct of privacy impact assessments on data processing systems. This will help mitigate or minimize risk in processing of personal information. Finally, to ensure readiness in case of security incidents or personal data breaches, as, as technology is uh, ever-changing, so is the risk. So for the unavoidable, a response team dedicated or a data breach response team dedicated to minimizing the impact of security incidents is therefore required. The widespread use of these smart applications has caused many security and privacy uh, problems or issues. The development of more advanced protection models and frameworks is important. Thus, the Commission is geared towards and focused on ensuring the protection of everyone and WANA. Uh, with this, uh, thank you very much. I will end my discussion. Uh, good day to everyone. And thank you very much, um, Attorney uh, Milanes. Okay, so we will hear more from him um, during the open forum. So, friends, um, at this point, uh, we have heard the reactions and insights of our discussants, and this time we would like to hear from you. So we have now come to the next part of our webinar, which is the Q&A or the open forum. But before I start reading your questions, uh, let's have a short break so to give time as well to our uh, discussants as they prepare to answer your questions. So let's have a poll, and we'd like to um, ask uh, what for you is the most pressing issue uh, hindering our cities to transition into smart cities? Um, earlier, uh, Tatum um, told us about uh, the challenges uh, faced by um, uh, the LGUs that they uh, interviewed or that they um, that, that were included in their study. Okay, so the question is um, okay. The question is now flash on the screen. So. I repeat, uh, this, this is the, our poll question. What is the most pressing issue that hinders our cities to trans transition into uh, smart cities? So what is your opinion on, um, on, on this topic? Okay, so is it A, inadequate ICT infrastructure? B, lack of uh, data interoperability? Uh, C, lack of uh, national standards on data, reposit uh, data repositories? Uh, D, insufficient technical and funding support. E, few smart city champions. Uh, or F, data privacy concerns. Okay, so we're giving you um, around uh, 10 seconds to uh, key in or to select your answer. Is it A, in, inadequate uh, ICT infrastructure? B, lack of data interoperability. C, lack of national standards or on data repositories. D, insufficient technical and funding support. E, use uh, smart city champions or F, data privacy concerns. Please key in your answer now. Gwen, just uh, give us a signal. Okay, Gwen? Yes, I'm closing the poll now. Okay, thank you very much. So we will reveal the, uh, the results uh, later. So uh, there is no right or uh, wrong answer. This is an opinion of a poll. And um, as I've said, I will announce the results later. So at this point, I invite our presenter, Ms. Tatum Ramos, to the open forum, and she will be joined by Dr. Uh, Marife Ballesteros, um, our vice president who uh, co-authored the study. And of course, we'll have our panel of reactors, Mayor Bernard D., Fisher, and Executive Director uh, Enrico Parinit, and Attorney Rainer Milanes of NPC. Okay, so let me... Uh, Okay, let me um, look at the questions. Okay, okay. For our first question, um, and this is uh, perhaps I can direct this to uh, Mayor um, uh, D. Um, considering um, uh, their experience in uh, in smart city uh, development, 
and uh, being an LGU. Um, Mayor D, this one is from Paul Rene Padilla. To, um, okay, and he's asking um, the effects of the possible effects of the Bandanas Garcia um, ruling on the. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Let me um, go to another question. Okay. So, what do you see are the challenges posed by the new devolved functions that have resulted from the Mandanas ruling? Are there also opportunities that the city government could be more sensitive to in advancing smart city aspirations? This one is from Oscar Badiola, a mayor D. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Sheila, uh, and to Oscar and Paul who asked that question. I think they're interrelated. First and foremost, the, there's a misconception that the Mandanas ruling will uh, enable the cities or LGUs, uh, all LGUs, to have more uh, disposable income because they have additional, uh, they have additional uh, resources, internal revenue, a lot through the internal revenue allotment. However, um, uh, there's a misconception because even if they have additional if even if we get additional resources starting this year, uh, the devolved functions naman is much greater. Uh, for example, like uh, a city like Hawaiian, we're still lucky, even if we're a third class city, malaki yung, uh, malaki po yung increase namin, 35%. Uh, however, that entails also more responsibility for us, like uh, the DOH, the DA, um, other DSWD, all those will be all those functions will be devolved to us so uh, in short kulang pa and what more kung hindi city uh, sa city malaki ang pondo ng mga city but what about the the municipalities i think up to fifth class hindi covered uh, but pero yung, what about the third class second class first class municipalities uh, they would be able to 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 really deliver the services that are um, that will be taken out uh, of support from the national government kung fully devolve yan so number one, that's a misconception na talagang additional income sa my LGUs then more disposable income. Uh, hindi po totoo yun. Abonado pa. Um, ang magsasuffer at the end of the day will be the services to the people. Uh, but I, I believe this will be a transition, a three-year transition. Uh, but it, kasi it cannot be overnight na, na, na mangyari yung fully devolved function. So I hope there's a moratorium that uh, after the third year, kung talagang hindi pa rin kaya, dapat nandun pa rin nakaalala yung national government but it also opens opportunities for the smart cities uh, uh, solutions and that's why it is very important for us to find sustainable solutions that I that will address uh, these kinds of um, evolved functions like like a more efficient uh, a more efficient undertaking on on uh, for example delivering uh, social services from DSWD uh, time and again as you all know every time na mag kakaroon ng ayuda ng uh, ng SAP and all those things hindi tumatama yung hindi tumatama yung number para tayong may reklamo uh, but we have I mean we can capture all this data and be more efficient and having more, more efficient governance uh, through smart solutions will have a better and more efficient uh, use of our resources that's why it opens a big big uh, opportunity because you're talking about so many so many national national uh, agencies that will be uh, fully devolved and if you just use these sustainable solutions these smart solutions then you can save and uh, use the resources in a more effective manner thank you very much mayor d okay so you've um, emphasized that you know having the mandanas uh, the implementation of the mandanas ruling which results in uh, additional revenues for our LGUs. It's a misconception that, you know, given this addi additional revenues, you can already uh, undertake, uh, you know, uh, smart city development uh, by yourself. Na hindi na kailangan ng ano, ng uh, support from the national uh, government. So in that case, um, let me jump to a question from Hexel Tulod. Sabi niya, should the national government directly subsidize LGUs in their pursuit of uh, smart cities? What is your opinion on this? They don't need to subsidize because there are a lot of solutions. In fact, um, um, not all smart solutions are expensive. Not all smart solutions are, are you know, can't be implemented. And that's why here in Kauai City, we, we, we want to share our journey that if a third class, highly agricultural city and poorest in terms of income can evolve as the Philippines' first smart city, there's no 
reason for other LGUs not to do it. Uh, there are a lot of ways of doing it. The MPPP, uh, um, engaging and collaborating with the private sector, with other NGAs like uh, Dr. Uh, Director Paringit. DOSC has been fully su supportive of our endeavors and smart cities. So it, it, you don't need a you know a whole a whole uh, chunk of money to implement mm -hmm. smart city solutions. Thank you. Um, um... Mayor, you, you mentioned about PPP because in the presentation of uh, Tatum, he, um, she mentioned that uh, what they saw in the in their studies that there's few there are few LGUs that are trying you know the the, the PPP model no and they're mostly reliant on uh, internal revenues no what is your experience on the the PPP model have you tried this for your smart city initiatives. Yes, we've tried a lot. In fact, uh, as early as 2014, we have been we have been uh, sort of presenting uh, Kawaiian City to different enablers, whether it be solutions providers, whether Globe, PLDT, uh, technology providers, and all, to use Kawaiian City as a uh, city lab uh, to to pilot uh, their their R and D or their solutions uh, and use it as a city lab. So that in that set in itself uh, put us in a position, in a very good position, to really get these uh, solutions for free as we have a pilot, and then we're the ones that uh, will market will market it. But uh, I mean, uh, technologies come and go and are uh, reinvented all the time, and that can still be done up to now. I mean, uh, a city a city in Mindanao, a city in Visayas can just say, "Oh, sige, uh, you may mga solutions providers, uh, come and use our city because this is the best." Test case, eh? you have a whole city as your lab. If it works, if it can work for that city, then definitely you can market it. What's, ni what's nice about it is that not, it's not only confined in, in, in our country. Now we're on the digital er era. So whatever can work in an LGU in the Philippines can also work uh, in an LGU all across the globe. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Yi. Okay, pahingahin ko muna si Mayor Yi. <laughs> <laughs> Go to our other discussions and then let us welcome other questions. We have a question here from uh, Dr. Julius Relampagos of University of San Carlos. And perhaps, uh, uh, Edie perhaps I can uh, address this question to you since it concerns about, you know, disaster risk reduction. Okay. Um, okay, let me read it. Um, Okay, it appears that the study has not included disaster preparedness and response of public utilities to mitigate the impact of natural calamities like super typhoons on major population centers. Should disaster preparedness and response of public utilities before, during, and after calamities be addressed in understanding the readiness of LGUs to implement uh, smart cities, smart city initiatives? What is your... Um, uh, view on this, uh, direct uh, ED Paringit, sir. Yeah, yes, uh, Sheila, ti very timely uh, question. Uh, in fact, I think uh, as part of the DOST Smarter uh, Cities Framework that uh, disaster risk reduction is uh, actually part and parcel of the uh, abilities of uh, smart uh, cities no? uh, that they need to have. It might not be uh, maybe directly stated, but uh, when you look at it, uh, actually, it's the, you know, being smart is being data savvy. So that mm -hmm. means they, uh, each city should have the capability, uh, the ability to have uh, information and data about the hazards available, uh, hazards that are present in their area of uh, mm -hmm. jurisdiction, uh, as well as the exposure no, of citizens and their assets. Uh, and that includes, of course, uh, you know, maps that tell uh, where the hazardous areas are, as well as where the citizens live, no, and uh, relative to these uh, places of hazard, like flood-prone areas, and of course the third component of that, uh, uh, in when dealing with this, is not just about you know having the information; it's being having the ability or having the information available to them about their options, no, and how to address their uh, uh, challenges when it comes to disasters. No? Mm -hmm. uh, this means that uh, they have a suite or a, a gamut of options available for them at the planning stage. Will they do relocation? Will they do evacuation in times of uh, uh, calamitous periods? No. Will they have, uh, you know, they have, do they have calculation of uh, goods, for example, when they uh, choose to actually evacuate uh, these areas and place them for in some uh, evacuation areas for a while and do they have the necessary resources for rehabilitation already calculated uh, as a matter as a result 
of their assessment coming again from the very data that they have uh, uh, previously collected no, to address this. So it's not about hoarding lots of data. No, that, 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 mm -hmm. I think that's one. one there's, I, I'd like to address this question about um, what is uh, non-negotiable when, uh, when you need to have a smart city or to be able to be considered a smart city. I'd say you need to, have a, you need to be data savvy. Mm -hmm. uh, without it, you wouldn't be able to anything. You wouldn't actually be uh, called smart, no. You, if you don't mm -hmm. know anything about your city, so mm -hmm. and that includes, of course, uh, what your resources. I already mentioned this earlier. You need to know what your resources are to indicate your strengths as well as your weaknesses. Number two, you need to know what uh, what also are your aspirations. Sinabi ko na kanina that you need to also identify what are the goals for your uh, cities. Of course, they, these are reflected on by the leaders, di ba? Parang mm -hmm. you, you choose leaders because they actually carry your aspiration as, as, as citizens of your city. And third is, of course, yun, yun nga, nandiyan yung technology kasi they can support you, achieve your aspirations according to the status or condition that you have, the, including, of course, your uh, the limitations brought about by your uh, natural state, like, you know, the presence of hazards. So, mm -hmm. I don't, ayaw kong sabihin yung Disaster, because disasters only happen we don't, you, when you don't actually deal with the hazards. Uh, that mm -hmm. means mitigating the effects or reducing the vulnerability of your uh, citizens uh, from uh, exposure to the hazards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so you've um, you've emphasized that you know, your disaster preparedness is a, it's an important indicator, no, um, to uh, uh, de determine whether um, cities are really ready to transition into smart cities. So in that case, because in the presentation of Tatum, they they listed a number of uh, you know indicators, no, their suggested indicators. So which means that there's a wide scope to expand these indicators, no. And if I may, um, uh, uh, you know, make a follow up, no. Um, does Ishard have a, you know, a set of indicators already na pwede nating uh, gamitin, no? Taking into consideration, of course, the, um, the indicators suggested by uh, the study team. Y yes. Uh, is this a work uh, in progress? Uh, we did have, uh, we did, we do have the Smarter Cities Framework, but indi it indicates there what are the areas that, uh, of uh, development no, in terms of smart city, um, uh, deployment of smart city technologies are like, for example, do you need to be smart in areas of transportation? Do you need to be smart in areas of disaster preparedness? Do you need to be smart on uh, aspects of health, education, and other uh, urban service delivery, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, solid waste management or wastewater management? No? So, uh, but again, uh, I'd like to emphasize that it all depends on what the aspirations are. Nabasa ko dito, tama yun, no? Uh, you don't actually need, being smart doesn't mean you need to be rich, no? That's, that's just one, mm. one, you know, one, one uh, actually is a side effect, sabihin na natin, or byproduct of being smart. If you mm. need to, if you can harness your being smart uh, to become rich as a, mm. uh, a wealthy, as a city, that's the goal, no? But if you want, uh, say, for example, to be uh, a smart city, uh, as uh, reflected on the kind of citizens that you produce, maybe producing professionals, businessmen, no, or uh, uh, being uh, being able to uh, actually improve their quality of life. Depende kasi yung, yung ibig sabihin ng quality of life. Eh. But I'd say that uh, we should be able to uh, identify what, what these aspirations are and see whether they actually correspond. No, uh, These goals actually correspond also with the resources that we have. No, you cannot be, say, for example, a a seat, a smart city uh, that have uh, that, that has uh, that has uh, features uh, that are more um, adept or are, are more adapt or adapted to, say, for example, to a uh, ba, a coastal or a marine setting. If you're actually inland, no, and like and then the opposite is true, no. Uh, hindi ka naman pwedeng mag na para ang eh. you, you look like an upland. Uh, uh, community like Baguio or Tagaytay when you're actually in the coastal community. So, mm -hmm. may binabagayan. That's why uh, I was telling earlier that uh, we need to consider the peculiarities of uh, each city in, in order to define what smart paths do we need to do, do we need to take according to their resources and according yes. to their aspirations. Very well said, sir. Thank you very much for emphasizing that. Um, 
Yes, um, yes. Atitum, go ahead. Uh, can I just add to that? Um, I just want to make a distinction between the indicators that we relayed earlier. So for, for the study, we provided the indicators on the readiness, uh, indicators on the readiness for smart city development. So I just want to distinguish that with indicators that the ISO have issued and also the Philippines have adopted. So these um, ISO smart city indicators are actually uh, what uh, LGUs or, or stakeholders can look at when they're already implementing their smart city initiatives. While the indicators that we relayed are more on um, the assessments uh, can be can be looked at when assessing whether LGUs are already prepared for smart city development. So just some um, examples on the ISO smart city indicators. These include, for example, the percentage of service contracts wherein city services have open have policy on open data, yearly online visits to municipal open data platform. So it's actually post implementation or during the implementation of the initiatives. Thank you, Tatum, for that clarification. So we have other, um, so many questions actually in our chat box. But let me um, uh, jump to this question uh, on, um, and, and this is for um, Attorney Melanes. Um, what are the safety nets of smart cities against hacking? You may want to, since you are a cybersecurity specialist, based on your profile, no. you may want to answer this question. No. Uh, not really a cybersecurity specialist, but uh, data privacy. Da data um, privacy. Like okay. Privacy professional. So uh, to give uh, uh, a, an answer to this question, actually, um, hacking, you know, even uh, as we go on developing systems, as we go on doing smart cities, you know, uh, even the hackers you know, uh, also uh, go uh, do things. You no, know, They also study. They also... Uh, they also level up on 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 this matter on on this hacking. So it's it's really inevitable. It's really inevitable that uh, eventually, if you do not also improve your security uh, when when it comes to uh, data protection, it is also inevitable that uh, this these things would be hacked. So the most important thing is, uh, uh, as I also mentioned earlier, the most important thing in this. Uh, Topic uh, on on uh, in this uh, issue on hacking is uh, the readiness, no, to be able to the readiness to be able to uh, uh, evolve, no, from from uh, the from our our um, truly evolve until uh, we also uh, adapt to the changes in in uh what what's happening around us in te technology and uh data security so for for hacking really uh uh for for lgus or for um, personal information controllers to be exact uh, who holds personal data or who holds who, who processes personal data they should be uh accountable for this and they should have uh, programs and frameworks to address these things now uh what you need to do is uh, not really to uh, uh, eradicate no it's it's really impossible but what you can do is to mitigate no you 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 have to plan you have to check you you have to do your privacy impact assessment so that you'll be able to see the risk involved in processing of personal data and then afterwards you can mitigate you can minimize uh, even you you can also explore the possibility of transferring this risk to uh, other third parties who are very much capable of doing the cybersecurity and mm -hmm. uh, who has the infrastructure to protect against this uh, uh, hacking and against ransomware, malware, or viruses that uh, also continuously evolving are are, conti are continuously evolving. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Attorney Milanes. Okay, let's jump to. Um the uh, issue of um, digital divide, issue of connectivity, access to technology. And we have um, questions on that, on, on those issues from uh, Hilary Yuzin Tun, from um, Jairus Klimatu. So uh, perhaps we can ask uh, these questions to Mayor D uh, based on um, the experience of uh, his LGU. So, um, 
Okay, what do you think are the elements we should pay attention so that we are not creating exclu exclusivity as we use more technology to become smart cities? And okay, how are uh, we ensuring that all has all have access to the connectivity in the first place since building networks and solutions that can be solely accessed through digital means may be um, marginalizing most people who do not even have the possession or ownership of technology. Um, Mayor D. Thank you, ma'am. Um, that's a very valid question, and that's something uh, that uh, is still uh, continues to be a challenge. Uh, all the solutions that are in place, uh, not everybody uh, will adapt to it right away. Not everybody will embrace it. Not everybody will use it, uh, and that's why uh, you. I think that you have to be persistent. That the smart solutions that you you uh, present will be something that uh, uh, is acceptable, number one, ad adaptable, uh, that is something that uh, is user-friendly, that will they will really use and embrace. I say it's, it's really about, for example, as uh, one of our, our experiences, we're in a, a highly agricultural city, so halos 90% po sa amin farmers. And then how do you, how do you link a, a, high, a highly technological or uh, uh, solutions with, 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 with farmers? So we intervene with programs such as our the Digi Digital Farmers Program or mentoring the farmers on how to use the technology. Um, the senior citizens uh, uh, also also are, are, are um, you know, there's a digital divide also with the senior citizens in terms of using their, whether it be the citizen ID and all these things that we do. Uh, we, we still continue to engage them. Uh, for example, for the, for the, the, uh, user, using the interface or using the internet. Abuti na lang lahat ng lahat sila ngayon, maski mga senior citizens natin, if Facebook na. Uh, Facebook has helped us, uh, uh, you know, bridge that gap. Um, and we, we, I think uh, the main goal here is uh, it will continue to be a challenge because uh, any solutions that you give, that you present, uh, uh, there's really a question whether it will, you know, it's changed for it's a disruptor. For everybody, so uh, just be persistent. Just make sure that uh, uh, you you always engage the citizens and not and not impose on them um, these solutions. It's supposed to be make their lives easier, not make it complicated. Thank you very much, Mayor D. Okay, I have a question. Um, and and well, this is about the pandemic. How has um how has being a smart city helped your LGU? in addressing the impacts of, of the pandemic, such as in terms of connecting with citizens, in delivering public services. I saw in the presentation of Tatum that you have, you know, some initiatives, uh, smart, city initia smart city initiatives related to the COVID-19. Yeah, for the, for example, the, the, um, the distribution of relief assistance, uh, uh, we, we already have a data, an accurate data on, on uh, who and how many who to give, how many households to give, and how uh, the exact number on how many. We, we, we have a system called Relief Assistance Monitoring System, wherein um, each, in each of them, uh, each uh, recipient or the households will, will uh, register online uh, um, how many they are in the house. But yun nga, there are some that don't have uh, don't have uh, access to the internet. So we also still have a parallel uh, registration where in, in the first wave of relief goods, we give them the, the actual uh, registration form that the, the barangay uh, kagawas or captain should return to us. So we have an accurate data. Para every time we're doing the uh, ayuda, it's it's more efficient and effective. We already know how many, if, if there's a flood that happens in that barangay, we already have a and more more or less accurate number um our our citizens have been uh, um already you know um exposed to qr codes and then when the pandemic hit the you know we used the no qr code no entry system so all of them were were easily already acquainted with these kinds of technology so i think th that in itself uh, jump started uh, um the digitalization in pandemic but we sort of got a head start uh, the citizens got a head start in using technology Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor D. There's an interest, interesting question here from uh, Director Ana Bonagua of uh, the DALG. And uh, everyone is welcome to uh, answer this question. What are the parameters you can recommend to measure smart city developments? Does it only cover digital solutions, uh, technology inclusions, or climate resilience, environment uh, friendliness? Uh, okay. Can we start? Uh, 
Tatum, would you like to take a crack on this question? And then I will call uh, Dr. Ballesteros as well. All right. Uh, so we would recommend referring to the Philippine National Standards, given that this is actually already issued by the Bureau of Philippine Standards and should be adopted um, by, by stakeholders of smart cities. So. Uh, so the PNS ISO actually categorizes um, smart city indicators accord accordingly. So there's e economy, education, environment, envi uh, finance, energy, health, and so on. So um, the LGUs do not necessarily need to um, have like a perfect score for all of e these indicators, but they would have to assess first which among the sectors they they should prioritize based on the needs of their constituents so um and then they 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 can dwell into the sectors that have been uh included under um the ISO i uh so i think um maybe probably dr belisteros can add to it, to that then go ahead yeah good afternoon everyone yeah, actually, I started this uh, research, but it was completed and implemented by Tatum and uh, the rest of the, the authors. Anyway, uh, to address the question of uh, Director Banagua, yeah, actually, when you look at parameters, uh, I think it could be best answered by first looking at ano ba yung concept ng smart city. So, Edi Paringit actually said it's a movement, but to me, it's a process. If we look at the, the, I would call it more as a process. If you look at the working definition that we have formulated based on the review of literature, it starts with a structure, no? technology structure. And the basic elements there is it's the data, the infrastructure, and the technology. Mm -hmm. So from there, I think you cannot call any, any cities digital or smart or intelligent city without these basic elements. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you use those technology to sense, to monitor, to trans to process the information you get from that. It's not just gathering the data and translate it into a, 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 an effective uh, service delivery. And that's why you, if you look at what were the function, this is where the LGU actually differs because they can aspire either to start with a, a civic and social um, mm -hmm. uh, focus on that functions. And as we see it, the way we see it, Marami yung focusing on road safety. Mm -hmm. They built that, they started smart city development because of road safety. I think Kawayan has really broadened it. And in fact, if you want disaster management, their experience is very uh, good on that. And it might be good for him to relate it uh, later, then you can also start with health and well well being, which mm -hmm. in the case of San Fernando, they started with that during the pandemic to improve their health systems and their health monitoring uh, 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 system as well as their services. So, so I can it starts with with those, and then the rest I think will come in. My indicators na sinasabi uh, kanina. So that's how. Uh, Yung, yung concept na yun comes in, yung first understanding what is the concept of smart city. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I may say, this is different when you just say sustainable uh, development, because yung smart city has a process, may framework, eh. you build on these elements, and as you build it on, you can actually uh, look, focus on different functions. Uh, unlike, for instance, if you just say sustainable city, you come you always come up with just an outcome, environmentally sustainable cities. But how do you ar arrive at that? Iba, iba, diba? Sabi ng iba, oh, green, green, environment, etc. So what happens if it's just that kung wala kang framework, kung wala kang working definition, you have siloed, uh, siloed in development more. So uh, that's why we're pushing for smart city, intelligent digital city, because you have uh, a pro it, it's a process, and it, it you build up on that uh, on those uh, elements. So that's how I would uh, respond to to that questions. I hope that's um, clear to us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malisteros. Um, may he, may we hear from um, uh, Edi Paringit? 
sir? Any thoughts? Can you please repeat? Okay. I was last time. <laughs> yeah. it, it's okay, sir. So this question is from uh, Director Ana Bonagua of uh, the DILG. What are the parameters uh, you can recommend to measure smart city developments? Does it, only, does it only cover digital solutions or technology ah. inclusions, climate resilience, environmental friendliness, and others? Yeah. Uh, yeah, very interesting question. Uh, um, I think we we ought not to be thematic on this uh, matter, no, because I I, I was uh, saying earlier that uh, it really depends on the thrust of the uh, of the city, no, in in uh, in uh, uh, in subject, no. Uh, they they can have different uh, challenges. They can have different uh, interests. They can have different also opportunities afforded by the resources available to them. So sometimes that's where they are uh, pursue. But in terms of, uh, as I said, key characteristics, I, uh, a smart city is usually data savvy. No? So they would need all the means that they can get in order to get the data for them to rationalize the actions that they will take uh, for their planning uh, uh, for their planning concerns. Karina, I was reading through the, some of the comments or uh, our questions, and it was uh, saying something about how about the connection with the CLUP preparation yes, or yes. Uh, the, so, uh, there was a question uh, yeah, development plan preparation again uh, uh, when you when you develop all of these uh, comprehensive land use plans it actually makes use of all of the data that's already uh, being collected by the by the different planning offices so in a way that's already being smart but whether you're doing it on a uh, you know transparency sheets of uh, map data in order to identify the uh, for example the uh, the suitable area for a certain type of development, or whether you're using it in a GIS uh, platform where you can overlay digitally uh, to and use a SIB analysis to identify, for example, a suitable area. That makes a whole lot of difference in terms of approach, in terms of precision, in terms of uh, efficiency in the way how it's done. So that's a smartness in a, in a way. Now, you can do things, uh, as I, I, I'd like to amplify what uh, Dr. Balistero said, uh, there's a smart way of doing things. There's an, maybe let's just say there's an ordinary uh, way of uh, doing things because if you're doing things smart, uh, you would have elements actually of being more, you know, being more efficient with things. You it can be more, you can be more uh, competitive because you're always uh, doing it uh, faster, better, uh, more accurate, no? Which actually translates to some uh, form of productivity uh, in the way we do things. So that's uh that those are you know reflections of uh, of being uh, of being smart. So earlier, uh, uh, Michelle, uh, uh, Ms. Tatum, sorry, uh, mentioned about uh, there are two main sets of indicators. One is indicators of how you want to grow as a city, mm -hmm. and what are the indicators of uh, uh, being smart. So well, there are indicators of being you know digital, being have having access. I think we can also divide it in terms of um of you know that the, the types of uh, participants or stakeholders in the uh pursuit of being uh, a smart city one uh what what is the level of citizen engagement do they actually make use of these smart city solutions uh mm -hmm. number two is of course the readiness also of the ones that are deploying all of these smart city solutions of course our uh, officials at the city hall no uh and whether uh, you know they're actually developing uh, fit for purpose solutions. I was uh, I texted that in the chat box that sometimes you have to develop things that are appropriate for use of the citizens and not just copy something else that that's works right. maybe in some mm -hmm. other some mm -hmm. other city. So that's actually part of the uh, uh, part of the uh, the the things that the, the, that need to be done. No, and then the number three, of course, uh, uh, you need to have the digital infrastructure to make it happen. No? Because mm -hmm. if they're, the two are disjuncted, uh, if people cannot see their, if uh, leaders do not see their citizens and vice versa, uh, even if you have, you know, uh, some solutions uh, in, in silos, for example, or uh, that are disjuncted, uh, we may not be able to put it together. So integration is also a key, and that's only afforded by uh, interoperability solutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, e, um, Edi Padingit. Okay. Um, okay, let's have a short break by looking at the results of our poll. Um, when is it ready? Can you 
please uh, flash the results. On um, earlier, we asked uh, in our poll, what is the most pressing issue that you uh, <laughs> consider uh, that um, LGUs or or um, the hinder LG uh, cities, no, from transitioning into smart cities? So very interesting results. Okay. The uh, the top most reason is insufficient technical and uh, financial uh, capacity, um, followed by inadequate ICT infrastructure. Then third is lack of national standards um, in uh, in terms of data and interoperability. Then next is lack ah okay national standards in uh, coming up with data rep repositories. Then next is lack of data interoperability. Then few smart city champions. And last is data privacy concerns. Okay. Um, I think um, Attorney Milanes is quite happy with the results because that's the least, <laughs> the least issue um, <laughs> identified or selected by our respondents. Okay, I, I hope that um, uh, the poll has been uh, useful to our uh, discussions and those two who are um, uh, participating in this uh, uh, yeah. webinar as well. Yes, Edi Paringi, yeah. go Sheila, ahead. Sheila, sir. before we just break, uh, I, I just would like to put in a few more thoughts on uh, issue of the, 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 the role of data privacy. You know? Yes, sir. Uh, one one uh, clarification that maybe th that we also need to have is the that very important step mm. of anonymization. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to anonymize all of this data in order for you know personal data to have benign effects on the whatever analysis or uh, 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 processes that we're going to use moving forward in uh, any smart city uh, solution or step. Uh, I think this is, has been one of the you know the missing. Uh, missing points in some dialogue about data privacy. Akala nila lahat ng data gagamitin sa data. No? I mean, you can go back and actually decipher which uh, which part actually identifies this data set to a particular person. But uh, it's not. No? It's almost like, you know, average over the entire barangay or average over the entire uh, uh, municipality in in most cases. And that's what, that, what, that's what happens. There's some kind of statistical already reduction of... Uh, data in, so, in order to get the patterns or the trends no so wag silang magalala <laughs> people shouldn't worry about uh, them being traced back uh, from mm -hmm. the uh, the results of the anal analysis that are being presented in uh, some uh, smart city ano, smart city analysis uh, that are that are being presented you know po thank yung you role much. ng anonymization thank you very much for emphasizing that Edi Parinit. I saw um, attorney Milanis nodding his head. Would you like to contribute to this uh, yes. topic? Of course, attorney, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Edi Parinit. Uh, obviously, for research and development, uh, when you use data, particularly on your research, it's very important no, to, uh, as we you know, advocate sa Data Privacy Commission, it's very important yung, yung concept of anonymization na uh, sinasabi ni Director, uh, executive director, the ED, because really, you no, know, uh, when we check on your compliance with the Data Privacy Act, uh, we we all always check on the security measures that you 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 implement. Uh, for example, for uh, smart cities, ito yung mga uh, these cities who are uh, in the process or or using this uh, technology, you no. Know, in gathering and processing personal information, using them for study, the the more important thing here is uh, like uh, what Ed Ed uh, Ed said, you uh, the anonymization of the data, because uh, when you anonymize data, you can it's it's going to be very useful for for a lot of things. But then again, the risk involved in the processing of personal information will be minimized because uh, hindi ka ma you cannot be uh, liable for a data breach of shared no when there's a data breach and you shared personal information of uh, your constituents uh, who are part of the study so anonymization is one great tool no to use so uh, yun yung, uh, that's one 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 very good no, practice when you when you do studies like this is uh, you you really no you really take charge in uh, using that data to the fullest but then again 
keep in mind the privacy, uh, data privacy of every individual of every data subject. And that is what we check and that is what all we, we always advocate and that is what we check on compliant on the compliance of this um, personal information controllers. So at least, and uh, if you do that, at least uh, you are you, you, in the sense na you won't be you won't be penalized for violating the law, the Data Privacy Act. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Milanes. Okay, let's enter in another question. And Tatum, this is addressed to you, uh, Daniel Maches. Um, he said. Based on the presentation, one of the motivations of a smart city is a sustainable environment. But it seems that the cities selected for the study and the metrics used to characterize a smart city do not have substantial consideration for the natural environment. It's more like the criteria of a smart city is having technological advances and innovations. But what about resorting? But what about um, Restoring damaged ecosystems like forests, rivers, swamps, and lakes within or near the city. Shouldn't innovation and environmental preservation go hand in hand to truly have a smart and sustainable city? How do we also deal with land grabbing attempts of some businessmen and other sectors that encroaches water or watersheds, which are vital for city resilience? I think uh, uh, Dr. Balisteros uh, um made an, a comment um uh, you know around this uh, uh topic uh a while ago when he said that you know um lgus or city should uh, determine kung ano talaga yung gusto nilang uh, maabot uh, by becoming a smart city so um uh taking into consideration ano yung motivation niya at ano yung goal nila na, ma na marating by being a smart city um okay tayo uh, yes, Ma'am Sheila. So we actually noted this in the study that uh, only a few of our interviewers were actually emphasizing uh, the the potential um, uh, environmental degradation that can be brought about by by um, smart city development. But um, well, we 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 do. We we've taken note that um there are some issues like um in in Manila and Dumaguete with reclamation projects that are connected with smart cities and we 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 would like to um recommend that further studies be done on um seeing the net potential net benefits or net net losses of implementing these initiatives uh side by side with environmental uh, potential by environmental degradation but we also see some cities that are implementing um smart city initiatives that are for the environment so for example in mandawe I've, I've shown earlier that there are some solid waste management technologies um they've been um uh using for example their uh, solid waste and converting it into energy um for for construction purposes and well these things come si uh, hand hand in hand there's always two sides of a coin so um we have to look further um whether we're whether the lgus or the constituents are uh in total benefiting from these smart city initiatives and we have to uh eventually select those initiatives that would um uh would be assessed or or would turn out to have potential benefits. Thank you, Tatum. Um, Director Balisteros. Yeah, yeah. I would like to add add to that. Um, we should uh, uh, we should uh, be clear that when the smart city or digital city, this is not mutually exclusive from sustainable city. Mm -hmm. They actually should go hand. Hand in hand, because mm -hmm. it's the outcome that you want. Mm -hmm. Sustainable city is also an outcome for smart city. Smart city. And in fact, as I mentioned, we have been using technology, smart smart city uh, initiatives for environmental um, mm -hmm. uh, environmental objectives. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, this in disaster management. Mm -hmm, in energy, mm -hmm. um, energy, um, yeah, renewable energy, etc. So, actually, hindi siya, it should, it should go hand in hand. Because yeah. if if you're having smart city and the the effects are are uh, negative, then you should not be uh, pursuing that kind of uh, yeah. development. 
And I think you mentioned, uh, you in, uh, emphasized that in your working definition, the working definition that you came up uh, in your in your presentation based on the PNS, no? Uh, definition. So it's very, it's uh, clear there that the outcomes are qu high quality of life, competitive economy, and uh, uh, what, what's the other one? Sustainable, sustainable environment. Sustainable environment. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you very uh, much. When, yeah. And when okay. I said aspirations, actually, it's just uh, municipalities or LGUs focusing on a specific uh, f uh, function, like whether it's civic and social, because uh, you have to start something small. You cannot immediately uh, um, you cover all of the all of the aspects like health, safety, quality, environment. So when we say um, aspiration, you first start with what is the most priority. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you cannot go into the other aspects. That's right. That's that. right. So build up on that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Uh, Ballesteros. Okay, we had still have a lot of questions. So let me go to, okay, uh, Director Padingit, uh, there is a question here which uh, our participant uh, really wants your answer. And it is about, you know, uh, solid and liquid waste management. Uh, she's asking how smart cities, development of smart cities can help address our solid and liquid waste management issues. Uh, Mari, this is from Maria Buena, okay, Buena Victoria, and there's another one, okay, uh, okay, sir, go ahead. Yeah, 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 about waste management, again, uh, balik tayo din sa data, no, you need to get data about uh, your waste uh, characteristics, no, uh, and then, you know, it's the use of the data that will, you know, make a whole lot of difference. So you start by you know uh, calculating what's the volume of waste generation, what are the characteristics? Are they made comp of uh, uh, of uh, biodegradable, uh, combustible, uh, you know? Uh, and then of course try, try to also determine where they're coming from. No? So there are different uh, ways uh, uh, data that you're going to need in order to plan out. Uh, in a smart way, how are you going to deploy your solution? So you, is your solution, for example, coming up with a uh, uh, a smart way of collecting garbage, for example. No, so there are smart city solutions for that. Like I've I've gone through some uh, projects that say we want to develop the optimal route so that your garbage uh, is collected on time, or uh, maybe collected and put in uh, some uh, place where you can actually segregate them more effectively. So those are uh, actually smart uh, city solutions. No, uh, that uh, that can actually be deployed for wastewater. Th it's the same thing. Characterize what's what's really coming out of. Uh, uh, these uh, places, uh, uh, and it's actually more tricky in the Philippines because we're sort of uh, more. I always joke that uh, we're more advanced. No, we like to combine our uh, storm water with the uh, wastewater, uh, actually, but that's not, but that's not really desirable. But uh, in uh, w whatever it is, we must be able to measure it first because sabi nga nila, you cannot uh, do anything or you cannot uh, actually solve uh, problems if we do not first measure. No, we cannot hope to improve uh, things that we do if we do not first measure. But be beyond no no uh, uh the way it's taught to us is that we always get baseline data no in order mm -hmm. to improve things but in this day and age when you can deploy iot devices in order to continuously monitor say for example the tro the flow of traffic pedestrian as well as uh, solid waste generation as well as uh, wastewater generation you can continuously measure bod cod di di uh, dissolved oxygen no so that you will be able to to say well uh, this uh, characteristic, this uh, parameter in water quality needs to be improved. Mababa ang BOD, hindi mabubuhay ang mga halaman, for example. No? So, those are the, the, the things that we need to understand. Then we deploy uh, the solutions that are more appropriate. What mm -hmm. we've seen is that there are many, you know, environmental solutions offered or being deployed out there that are uh, not fit for purpose and they're not appropriately sized. Kumisa masyadong malaki. You need a big mm -hmm. amount of, for example, waste. I saw here waste, uh, waste to energy. To uh, energy. Mm -hmm. malaki kasi the waste generation of the entire town is not really enough to feed into as a feedstock to uh, mm -hmm. the waste to energy uh, facility. Things like that. Nangyayari na, no? It happens. Also true with the uh, uh, wastewater treatment facility. They're oversized. No? Uh, and you cannot sustain the operations of these facilities if they're not uh, right-sized. And number two, mm -hmm. 
of course, as you go through the different processes for stage uh, filtration, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the, the process of uh, treating uh, waste or wastewater, you need to also monitor the improvements that are taking place until such time that you get to the end where you also measure the water and say already this class, this this uh, water, the, the 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 type of water that goes out of the treatment facility passes, say for example, a DNR class A standard. Well, mahirap naman yata yun. That's for drinking, no? But uh, what I'm saying is that uh, we need to also measure as we uh, as we provide solutions uh, for them. Because if we don't measure, we will not be able to actually find that the optimal uh, solution. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just going to waste time, resources, and money in some solutions that are not really uh, getting us the most benefit. Thank you, Idi Paringit. Okay, we have a question regarding interoperability interoperability standards okay mm. and this one is from uh, paul rene padilla what interoperability standards policies and efforts are being done now to allow various lgus to exchange related uh data and we what we did was to um ask a uh, participant from the dict if he could answer this and he um sent us a uh a uh, his response uh, via text and this is from director paul tuason of the dict uh director three of the office of the undersecretary for policy of the ict he said that there's already a policy in place with regards to interoperability which may be accessed through okay she gave us um uh, the website uh but uh okay what i'll do is um I'll um I'll type this uh his response on our chat box, but perhaps uh okay it's now on our chat box okay that that's from uh, uh director Paul Tuason. but director Paringit you may want to add to this sir in terms of uh do you know if any regarding uh, okay. policy uh, in place uh if there's already a policy in place well he he said that there's already a policy in place but you may want to add to this. Well, I'm well. I haven't seen the policy issuance. Maybe it's uh, maybe it will be uh, quite recent now. But uh, if there if there is actually that will that's a, actually a welcome um, uh, welcome gesture on the part of the, the government to have this interoperability, interoperability standard because that also prompts all of, of course our local government units to um, tap onto solutions. No, uh, maybe coming from you know commercial service providers. Uh, uh, on uh, in, in to ensure also that they're uh, inter interoperable. Sometimes you know vendors uh, come in and say, "Well, uh, we we have this kind of standard that we employ, but uh, they are uh, not uh, compatible, no, and interoperable to work with uh, systems that are also available, no, with uh, or uh, being used in other local government units. That hinders actually the, uh, as I said, the uh, the aggregation of data at some uh, higher level like, of governance, like a uh, like a province or even at the region on the, so that also hinders the uh, the integration of data for purposes of coming up with the development plans that are inter ano, inter uh, lgus or inter uh, jurisdictions that's actually the, the point of having this this uh, interoperability you, you the, the, the the ability to aggregate and integrate data becomes more uh, convenient no uh, so the the so in in that respect uh we would actually welcome because this could be a good guide for our uh, uh our uh, local government units when they now try to engage whether you know whether it's through a grant or a partnership with a uh, foreign uh, entity or even uh, through a commercial service provider if they're uh, that rich you know they could uh, uh, employ this uh, interoper interoperable standards as part of the maybe the terms of reference when they uh, you know put out contracts out there because in the absence of uh, standards, in the absence of specifications that uh, uh, point to interoperability standards, they will be actually be uh, vulnerable to uh, isolation. No? Hindi nila connect yung system nila with what others uh, out there are uh, using. So that's the that's the threat, I think, if we do not have this uh, interoper interoperability standard. Okay, thank you very much, um, Edi Paringit. Okay, there's a question on the role of, uh, okay, from Raquel Atawe. Is there any findings in the research on the role of the private sector in data sharing? Because a big chunk of the data for smart city is owned by the private sector. Um, Tatum, would you like to answer this? Then I will also go to, uh, okay, to Attorney Milanes 
after you? Actually, uh, what we've seen is it's more from the public or the constituents of the city that that would actually have the the data and and they they can share that with with their LGUs. But um, in 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 terms of the private sector or businesses engaging um to to facilitate this interoperability or data sharing, uh, we did not come across uh, any of um the stakeholders that we interviewed. Thank you, Tatum. Um, okay, let me jump to oh, this is better. Um, Mayor D, uh, in your um, journey, journey towards uh, becoming a smart city, how has your, um, you know, in terms of data sharing, um, the role of the private sector in terms of data sharing, have you encountered sir, any problems, any challenges? Uh, well, uh, in our journey, we have, um, it's not just the private sector that we partnered with, but with the academe. Uh, in fact, we house our server in, in our um, uh, partner state university, which is the Isabella State University, wherein we uh, put up a center there. It's a collaborative uh, uh, effort between the LGU, um, DOST, and Isabella State University. We put up the BIRDSEA, or the Business Intelligence Research Development Center, uh, that houses the uh, sort of data that uh, of the city. So in that way, um, um, there's also data that that can be used by students, uh, researchers, and stuff that can uh, help them, uh, whether it be research or bet, uh, whether it be um, any any studies that they're doing. But um, in terms of uh, the private sector, one of our partners is Multisys. Uh, who's the solutions provider on our online mm -hmm. payments and, our, and everything? Uh, who happens to be from Kauai and also. Uh, so far, we don't, uh, we have not encountered naman problems uh, on data privacy because uh, that has to be really uh, uh, be put in place because we're talking about uh, uh, figures already like RPTs, the business mm -hmm. taxes, uh, and that has to be really fully to be fully secured. So so far, we've not encountered a breach. We've not encountered. Uh, um, uh, headaches, uh, if you want yeah. to call it. But uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, any anyone that you talk to, uh, especially the private sector, both of it's both sides' responsibility uh, to to keep the data privacy in check. Uh, we have lost the man in place, so it's it's not going to be hard to implement. Thank you, um, Mayor D. Okay, let's move to other questions. But you may want to um, uh, um, share your thoughts also. Uh, Attorney Milanes, would you have anything to, to add? Yes, actually on, thank you, uh, Ms. Sheila. Actually on data sharing, uh, uh, our, uh, the, the NPC has already released the circular on, on, in 2020. Uh, this relates to data sharing agreements, our NPC circular 2020-03. So uh, basically, uh, data sharing agreements covers only personal information controllers. So personal information controller to another personal information controller may may no, the the word in the circular is may. So uh, but best practices, data privacy best practices. You should always no if you are, are going to enter into data, uh, you're going to do data in the processing of your personal information or sensitive personal information you are going to engage in data sharing with other PICs or uh, data sharing with your, your PIPs or personal information processors. When you deal with your personal information processor, since you're the controller, you can always just uh, uh, make it into a, uh, make this into a contract or a, a service agreement between a PIC and a PIP. But uh, for PICs and PIPs who will be sharing, no. Uh, so uh, sharing meaning pulling and pushing of data to uh, from another PIC to another PIC. You uh, uh, in our in our circular, this is already voluntary. It's not mandatory. But for uh, what? But we really would want to say is we for best practice, uh, best pra as best practice, uh, you should be covered. No, you you always cover always be covered by, by a data sharing agreement. So that in the data sharing agreement, you will be able to uh, enumerate you know, the, the responsibilities of the parties. Uh, uh, more importantly, in the in data privacy and information security. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, uh, Tatum. 
uh, I just want to share also what we've seen that um, international c- cities are doing in mm-hmm. terms of data protection. So um, they've, aside from having a national policy, a national policy on data protection, mm-hmm. cities themselves are implementing their own policies. So for example, the the Busan Metropolitan City has their own guidelines on personal information processing and handling, while Saragossa has a specific web page on data collection information. So they, they list down there the data processing activities are that are undertaken, how long is the data kept with the LGU or the, lo- uh, or the city. So these things I think we can um, uh, replicate in the Philippines uh, of, uh, and we would recommend LGUs to to look into those examples. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you very much, Tatum. Okay, let's jump to another question, and this time this is from uh, Dr. Tony Avil of Logo Dev. A smart city success depends on its ability to, to form a strong relationship between governments and the private sector. What should be the role of the private sector, and how do you mobilize the resources towards attaining smart city status perhaps i can start with mayor d and earlier he mentioned that his city partnered not only with the private sector but also with the academy so it's it's like you know um um not just stopping the private sector but also other sector as well other sectors as well mayor d go ahead uh, that's right po, ma'am. I mean, in fact in 2016 when the UN when the United Nations launched the U, the 17 uh, the new 70 sustainable development goals we transitioned from smart city to smart sustainable cities uh, and in that way all the plans and projects of the, of the city are uh, aligned um, addressing the global goals and one of it is uh, is really the, our part, our strong partnership with the DOST, with ISU, uh, and and that will also uh, maintain our sustainability, keep our sustainability. Like I'll be, I'll be graduating. I have my, it's my 107 day. I have 107 days left in office. I'm not running anymore. I'm graduating my uh, third term. So. What's going to happen with all the projects and programs that have, we have been implemented in the last uh, nine years? So this is a test uh, of the sustainability. Um, um, and that's why I think I am very confident that it will still be sustained because it's not just owned by the city government. Yes. It's owned by, it's a, it's a shared uh, pro, pro, uh, program mm-hmm. uh, with the private sector, with the, mm-hmm. with the academe. So, uh, I think uh, the private sector has has a lot uh, has a big role in 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 this journey uh, because uh, they will also benefit uh, with it uh, simple things like online payments online rp uh, business tax payments uh, can easily help them um, um, in 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 their day to day and and whatever solutions that uh, come up uh, definitely they they are part uh, of uh, the stakeholders that will uh, have a positive impact in their in their lives so uh, it it it, ha- it's, it doesn't have to be the LGU to engage the private sector. Private sector should also engage the the. Uh, it's a it's a, it's it should not be a one way uh, relationship. Uh, uh, it it should be you know uh, working together, uh, trying to collaborate with one another, and definitely um, there's more success in implementing these uh, sustainable solutions. Pagkaganum po. Salamat, salamat, Mayor. The very important points to mention on how to make smart city initiatives sustainable, no? So, hindi lang nakaangkla siya dun sa, you know, dun sa leader, uh, kung sino mang uh, chief executive ang nansyan. But related to that is may question tayo from Joel Cantores. Uh, does a smart city initiative require smart LGU leaders for this to be maintained, no? What are the best practices that can be put into place by the LGU leader who initiates a smart city initiative to ensure that this momentum can be sustained even with a change of LGU leadership? And you already mentioned that, you know, fostering closer linkages with the, uh, um, you know, private sector, academe, and other sectors, and really embedding, you know, the the, the smart city principle concept sa dun sa sa culture sa values ng ng LGU you know, na, naka ano na siya, embedded na siya. So, kahit na mawala man yung leader, you know, nand, nandun na siya, nandun na siya sa heart at sa consciousness nung, nung LGU at nung mga tao. But yeah. you may want to, uh, you know, comment on this uh, because this is also in the presentation of our presenter as an enabler kasi siya eh, yung smart city yeah. champions. 
Okay. On, on, on top of that, I, I just like to add, Ma'am Sheila, um, aside from the um, yeah, the ownership of the programs and projects na co co ownership na yan, so kahit sino umupo ng social administration, that's what happens eh. Pag may next administration, totally wipe out yung mga programs. But since may sense of ownership, uh, yung mga iba, tutuloy yan. But to really make uh, it sustainable and uh, really strong, um, th there are ordinances that uh, are passed uh, to institutionalize the programs. Uh, these things, kahit sino po yung kahit may mga change of administration o kahit walang walang uh, walang uh, walang uh, inclination on a smart uh, smart city framework magtutuloy-tuloy magiging sustainable if it's institutionalized so it is very important na talagang uh, ma-put in place maging institutionalized itong mga programs na to salamat salamat uh, mayor D uh, Tito may so you're nodding your head would you like to contribute to uh, this question yes uh, my take on that is that um, well, we, we recognize that smart city champions are enablers for smart city development. Probably um, um, this is important, especially when um, building the foundations um, mm. in, in, in implementing these initiatives. And then um, uh, also we, we've raised that one of the challenges um, for uh, sustainability um, is or, or the implementation of these initiatives is um, the change in um in local uh uh administration so or lo local governance so if there's a next administration um uh, the the private sector or ngas are quite um uh hesitant whether or they 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 don't know if if the if the initiatives are going to continue but one way that can uh, one one potential solution is for these smart city champions to again what what mayor d said um have ordinances have resolutions that would establish this um initiatives um also um well moas are are it, it's quite tricky for moas because some um private sector partners also mentioned that even if there's a moa some do not push through so we're really um pushing for on um, these ordinances to be implemented and issued. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Tato. Okay, uh, does any, okay, other, our other uh, discussions, uh, attorney, Idi Parinit, would we have anything to say regarding this uh, question? Uh, about the institu institutionalization of uh, efforts no, of uh, smart cities. Uh, of course, there are mechanisms to put it in place. No, it's already mentioned that uh, maybe a MOA or a uh, some kind of uh, policy could be put in place so that it will be followed. No, but I'd always like to believe that uh, I don't know. Maybe the naive. I I, I did not hold a uh, public position, but uh, from what I'm seeing, we can always agree on the vision. No, as a uh, as a community or as a, um, a local government units, and that's what binds us moving forward. And I always say that. Uh, Maybe the priorities just change, no? But mm. the plan will continue. You have this grand plan of how you want the city to evolve, but uh, to to develop. But maybe, maybe perhaps from one administration to the other, they have a different lens on the way how they look at their citizens, and they have different priorities. Baka unahin mo na to, unahin mo na yan, no? Uh, and that's what uh, we're actually af just after, no? Uh, it's just the changing of the priorities. But the the plan is a. Uh, is there the vision is mm. is held constant, no? And I think in all of the smart city solutions that we are going to have to deploy, that that should be geared towards that vision. Kaya ako sinasabi ko kanina yung yung shared goals and aspirations ang importante. Mm. importante so that in, oh. so that every, even if you replace it with somebody else's uh, priorities, magagawa pa rin yung kailang gawin. We can still do what we need to do according to the plan. It's just that the priorities have changed. Maybe uh, be, because, of course, uh, of the, uh, I don't know, sabi na natin political considerations of those that are uh, taking the seat at that time. Because, of course, they have uh, perhaps a different set of constituents that they're trying to cons to to uh, to consider. No, uh, mm -hmm. that's that's uh, that's the way I uh, the way I see it. We uh, the plan should always be held constant. The goal should always be as inclusive as uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Idi Paringit. Okay, let's let's move to incentives, no? So kanina, um, I think Idi Paringit mentioned that when we incentivize our LGUs, no, to embark on smart city development, is to include that 
uh, as one of the criteria in the grant of the SGLG, the Seal of Local Good Governance. So, Bing Bunoan is asking, okay, in addition to this, uh, what do you think are other incentives that the national government can give? See, sabi niyo rin kanina, uh, uh, pa rin it, you have this call for projects on smart cities. Marami bang nag, ano, nag apply ng mga LGUs? So that's yeah, one thing, no, it, to incentivize them and to motivate them, no? Yes, uh, siguro, uh, well, you have 1,000, what, 400 plus uh, uh -huh. LGUs. No? So LGUs. A, I, I, would, uh, I would cringe on the, ano, na, because we only have funds for like maybe five or seven at mm. any given time no, to support. But, you know, what we're saying the, in usually in this fora about uh, support for uh, developing smart cities that they're taken in as models no, so that ad others can emulate. And the mm. second the purpose is for them to actually exchange notes on what works for one city that might be applicable to another city uh, and uh, have them uh, replicated. So I would venture to say that, yes, uh, we have calls to, for proposals for uh, smart city solutions. This is actually coming out of the fact that I would just like to relay that. And dami kasi namin technologies that were, you know, supporting us as, as matters of uh, research and development that mm -hmm. have actually useful applications in a local government setting. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's uh, what is uh, usually in a citizen's mind, no? uh, solutions for traffic, solutions for uh, waste uh, management, solutions for, you know, the things that actually challenge us as, uh, as city dwellers. No? So, so sabi ko, why don't we come up with, um, with a program that tries to tie all of this? Because the, really the concept is trying to integrate all of these solutions together in mm -hmm. a city uh, setting. No? Mm. Because, of course, you, you cannot really manage... Uh, one aspect of a uh, city you no, know, without actually looking at the other now, the second opportunity is that there are many solutions that are have common resources to use like cctv it can be used for disaster management it can be used for uh, uh crime uh, prevention it can or monitor or monitoring it can be used actually also for traffic uh, monitoring so uh you, in that way they could actually optimize the use of these resources that are already available at the disposal of uh the city. So yes, meron po kaming call for proposals, a shameless campaign na ito. Uh, okay lang, sir. Very relevant Okay. The other opportunity, yung, I think it was uh, mentioned earlier, and thank you, Tatum, also for citing it, no? yung ating good governance uh, through data science and uh, uh, decision support. Now, this actually parang small grants that we provide to cities that are trying to digitalize, no? yung digital transformation. Sometimes, uh, and, you know, digital transformation is not just about encoding all of your paper-based data uh, back in the city hall. No? Oh, it's also trying to make sense what's coming out of them. I think that's this, this is the part that's usually missing in uh, cities. No? They, okay, we, did, we digitized it. So many records of transactions, of business permits, uh, licenses, uh, real estate uh, payments, no? uh, even tricycle uh, driver permits or something like that. No? Uh, pero how do you make sense out of this? No, you, I think that's the opportunity. It's trying to make sense of the data to find opportunities, all sort of problems, because this is what the data is telling us. That's the that's the rationale behind the goddess. So we have models of uh, of uh, solutions you no know, being offered by university-based researchers. I alam ko uh, uh, Mayor D knows this that uh, for Kawayan, for example. They've deployed some kind of solution to address the flooding problem in the area, no? uh, making use of analytics about exposure and uh, vulnerability of people living in uh, flood-prone areas, things like that. No? And then that mm -hmm. helps actually understand the, the role of information and data on uh, putting out uh, key so solutions no? or management interventions so that we minimize uh, the risks uh, coming out of those events so it can if it can be done for disaster management certainly it can be done for health applications education uh, and other uh, roles that a typical uh, uh, city government would uh, usually uh, provide as a matter of service to its citizens so yun yung call natin for uh, this process of parang smart i think we call it the smart city challenge mm -hmm. thank you very much uh uh ed paring it no I, I i have a question regarding ano synergy because you know, different government agencies have their respective, you know, initiatives programs uh, for smart city development. And, and there has to be synergy, you know, there has to be, uh, you know, this 
dapat nagpo-coordinate yung iba-iba nating mga ahensya ng pamahalaan ano. Um and and I'd like to know because okay, for instance, CHED is uh, promoting the building of smart campuses. Okay? Mm -hmm. There has to be, you know, synergy among all ages is concerned yung private sector and LGUs because let's say itong mga smart city uh, smart campuses na to, no? This will be located or implemented within cities. Um sino ba Okay, first question is who is really driving or okay, who is really parang uh, parang tagakumpas, overall na tagakumpas when it comes to smart city initiatives. That's one. Kasi importante yun eh, no? Okay. <laughs> okay, yun na lang, yun na lang sir. <laughs> yun na lang yung yung tanong ko, uh, sino talaga yung tagakumpas? When you say smart city, I don't even really in that position uh, to answer that question. But uh, what we're providing in the USD is our opportunities to to actually showcase all of these wonderful technologies that are that have potential to have applications in smart uh, cities. Actually, parati kong sinasabi, I always say it's not just for cities. No, it could actually for even for medium sized or even pana ba uh, uh, um, class five uh, municipality. Because you can be poor, but you can be smart. I mean, poor in the sense that you don't have to be rich to be smart, right? You can mm -hmm. be smart, you can be agricultural based, and yet still smart. Things yeah, like Kawayan that. Kawayan has you, proven that. Kawayan. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so what, 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 what I'm saying? We even have uh, actually projects related to smart buildings, no? Because, for example, how do you become energy efficient? How, how can you be energy efficient as a mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a building, as a facility, as a compound, no? So we deployed all of these technologies that make sure that you know, you think na you know, if there's nobody in the room, you can it, the 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 room actually is automatically shuts down its uh, lighting or in uh, in uh, air conditioning, things so like that. No, these are smart city smart solutions that could actually be scaled, no, as you as you go up. But uh, I think one key important. Uh, uh, aspect of that is inter, yun nga, interoperability. How do you make sure that you will be able to aggregate all of the data? Well, not all, no, but some of the data as as you move up into the scale, no, from the scale of a uh, building to the the barangay or the community to the town to the province. Uh, I'm sure there will be some form of uh, integration that's uh, uh, that's needed and to make sense. All of the plans uh, that are also developed. For because uh, you cannot plan also in silos. That's the most important uh, aspect of this. You, know, you you cannot plan in isolation. When you go down to the province, you need to consider multiple cities and uh, uh, LGUs. When you plan for uh, no, for a region for the regional development plan, you need also to consider the different uh, provinces and cities uh, composing the plan. So data is uh, is uh, contributed by each of the cities, and they need to be sent or they need to be collected uh, more efficiently. Uh, I've always been saying that you know, we, our planners considerably spent a lot of their time just collecting the data instead of focusing on uh, coming up with good plans, no, for their uh, uh, for their areas. I, I think we need to shift it by saying we spent uh, lesser time collecting data. We spent more time uh, doing the plan. I think that's uh, that's 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 being smart. Okay. <laughs> if I may okay. say, kung sino yung uh, Magkokompas nito mga to. I would say, well, we can offer solutions sa uh, sa DOST. We've we've been coordinating, of course, with DICT. Kasi yung information infrastructure ay uh, sila ang malaki ang uh, ang mandate. Of course, with uh, with DILG, of course, because they have a direct hand. I think DILG is the like the shoe in for me. Uh, but there are other aspects that maybe we need to also. Uh, considered to be part of that room or figuring out the pal the key policies that need to be mm -hmm. put in place to make sure that the smart cities are are completely provided for. So, nandiyan si HLURB para dun sa planning. Uh -huh. Nandiyan si DOTR kasi because of the transportation plans that need to okay. be provided for. No, Pero in terms of leading it, I think the LLG, pag sinabi niya na, hey, make it part of your uh, uh, seal of good governance, one of the tenants should be being smart. Or actually, I would go even a little bit bolder da, to say, pwede bang seal of uh, smart city rin? <laughs> Parang ganun, no? <laughs> so that, that's, uh, that, those are one of the things that we needed to have. In fact, uh, we even received reviews for legislations. No? Meron na eh. Meron mga nagpo-propose na ng uh, laws for uh, smart cities. No? So actually, nandun naman. Actually, but they're more looking into digital cities yung ng kanilang 
yun, yun ang kanilang tinitingnan. So, it's actual, actually already in the radar of our legislators and policy makers. So, uh, all we have to do is, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe hold a summit on smart cities and uh, yeah. Tatum mm -hmm. and its team could actually also present yeah. what we what can they, invite uh, all the uh, concerned uh, government agencies. No? <laughs> Sorry for putting yeah. you on the spot, uh, Dr. Edi Paringit, no, on, on that question, but I think that's very important. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, we're down to our last question, and uh, let me uh, entertain the question of uh, Mr. N uh, Nestor Tiglao. Okay, on okay, this is a bit on the national level. The role of national line agents is crucial in support of smart city goals, but most of them are quite slow in developing and adapting real innovations and closer interagency collaboration. So, how can we address this? Okay, any 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 thoughts? Uh, um, Tatum, would you like to take a crack first? Yeah, then I'll go I, to the rest of our speakers. I think this can be connected to the uh, previous question that was raised on yes. on having a lead agency. This is really mm -hmm. important because um, right now what we're seeing is that uh, there there are, well stakeholders are are. Are promoting these technology technology and innovation powered cities but there's not really a brand that's associated with that there's not a mm. consistent branding so as I'm, i mentioned earlier there's stakeholders saying oh this is digital city this is intelligent city this is smart city but what we need to have is to uh is to have that consistent image that we can share to our to the potential stakeholders of smart cities, because for example, if um, there are international uh, investor conferences, the the investors would look at um, how how um our uh, how our cities are packaged, and um, that's why um, this 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 branding is very essential at this point. Okay, thank you very much, um, Tatum. Okay. Uh -huh. maybe a short yeah, yes, maybe a short yes. uh, input to that, no. Uh, let me just make this a little bit more parang simple, no. Once I encountered a uh, a a city or well, a actually a local government unit. Uh that was trying to uh to take in investors in energy development. And they were actually choosing between that city and well, LGU and the adjacent LGU. And do you know the difference? why they uh, chose uh, to one city over the other, availability of data. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's being smart. They, they, they immediately have the, uh, the information that was, uh, that was uh, being requested by the, uh, by the investor so that uh, for the necessary for them to make a decision. And I think that makes a whole lot importance. And I think this has something to do with the branding. No? If you're saying, you know, I'm smart enough, I could provide you with all the information that you need in order for you to make a decision whether you can uh, partner or work with us or work in uh, uh work uh, locate with us no in because those are the we are trying to find opportunities as well as trying to just solve problems no know, disasters no pandemic those are problems so problem solving okay finding solutions is one but also in a uh, budding city in a ambitious city we also wa want to find opportunities no luring in investors making sure that they know what are the our key strengths, what are our assets, what are the opportunities for them, no? whether it's knowledge-based or resource-based. And the only thing that, uh, the only, uh, 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 I think what we need to then uh, impart or to, to share are uh, all of this uh, information that can be produced at the, you know, the palm of our hands, uh, if, if I may uh, put it at that, no? at, the, at, the, at the tip of our fingertips. And that's uh, that's actually being smart. So it's a branding, no? Uh, mm -hmm. That you are smart <laughs> only if you can, uh, if you know, uh, if you know what uh, what what your city is and what are the opportunities available in your city, uh, so that you know you can uh, get uh, investors on board. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have covered a lot of ground during our open forum. So to cap our discussion, may I ask each speaker for um, their brief. Uh, Final remarks. Uh, Tatum, can we start from you? Then uh, we'll go to our speakers. Uh, well, I think at this point, it's not really more of a question of whether um, the Philippine cities can become smart cities because 
they are uh, LGUs have actually been implementing these smart city initiatives, but we have to emphasize that um, the full potential of realizing uh, or, or the full potential may not be achieved unless the national government um, um, supports or, or and even addresses the challenges that um, are um, that LGUs or stakeholders are encountering in smart city development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tato. Um, okay, uh, I'll call uh, Dr. Uh, Ballesteros uh, last, but perhaps we can go first to Mayor D. Again, thank you very much, uh, PIDS, for this and uh, uh, the, um, uh, Ms. Tatum and Dr. Ballesteros for this wonderful uh, um, journey uh, definitely i think as uh, philippine cities are ready to be smart cities already um and smart cities are not exclusive i just want to say smart cities are just are not exclusive for highly urbanized metropolitan cities first world cities you know um it can be as complex as uh, uh, having sensors in every street in every corner uh, measuring this it can, this and that it can have uh, it can be as complicated complex as uh, having ordinances that uh, allow uh, uh, robots or driverless cars to roam around the streets, but it can also be as simple as informing the farmers if it's going to rain or not. It's the same impact. It's just, it has the same positive impact on the people, on the lives of the people. And if a city, again, like us, a highly agricultural, um, um, poorest in terms of income, uh, can can uh, do all these things and evolve as a smart city, there's really no reason for other LGUs not to do it. I can go up to the level of smarter barangays, smarter um, uh, people, smarter infrastructure, all these things. Uh, it can be done. So with that, uh, again, thank you for uh, uh, inviting us and sharing the humble experience of Kauaian City's journey to a smart and sustainable city. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Mayor D. Um, actually, what you said also answer, um, answer the question of Daniel Matches on how we can make smart city uh, initiatives inclusive. So um, we should ensure that um, sectors, you know, marginalized sectors should be not should not be sidelined uh, uh, by smart city initiatives and included in the um, overall development process. Thank you very much, Mayor D. Okay, uh, Mam Peng, uh, would you like to uh, say a few words? Just I thought I would be the last, but anyway, I would, I would <laughs> just like to take this opportunity to thank our um, discussants and all those uh, local governments and national uh, agencies, as well as the private uh, sector, business, as well as international development organization, who have shared their experiences and insights into the study and um, actually this further enrich what we have learned on the ground and hopefully we can um, provide when we finalize the study we will be able to provide more uh, more um, uh, a better or, or more uh, we can improve on the findings and recommendations of the study and yes i agree with the uh, with um, <laughs> uh, mayor d um sometimes it's not uh, the technology how much technology you have but actually how you are going to deploy uh, or exploit your technology so sabi uh, ni paring it you should just have a vision a mission and then you can start small based on what is achievable and available in terms of the resources and keep innovating thank you thank, thank you. you very much uh no sorry natinawag na kita kaagad okay let yeah, me go okay. first to um attorney uh rainier okay yes. Yes, uh, thank you to PIDS for the opportunity again for NPC to share you know, our, our initiatives towards you know, uh, um, towards this uh, smart cities. Um, the the may, may, the yung one major takeaway is uh, our 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 LGUs uh, smart city ready. So of course, you no know, all 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 our LGUs are smart city ready. But then again, as your regulator who regulates the processing of personal information. Uh, we also need to remind you that you should be compliant with the law. And uh, the paramount uh, consideration for processing of personal and sensitive personal information is that you protect you know, protect the data. As, as uh, already mentioned also by the uh, Honorable Mayor of Kauaian, uh, 
data is the new oil. So for mm -hmm. for data, uh, personal and sensitive uh, personal and sensitive personal information are, are also parts of the data that uh, we consider the new oil. So as as per our agency, uh, the National Privacy Commission, what's really important is you you really put up uh, organizational um physical and techno uh, technical measures to protect personal data of your data subjects thank you very much okay maraming salamat and of course last but not the least um ed uh enrico paringit of uh Pichard, sir <laughs> that's not, not expecting to uh, deliver the last lines but uh well when we talk of readiness uh, as mentioned earlier yun nga, uh, it, is, it seems like uh the question of readiness is uh, well, uh, there are different levels of readiness, but uh, it's more like maybe are are the cities ready for being smart, or mm. are smart city um, solutions and approaches ready for cities as well? I think parang it also we, we should also reflect on that. Our tech are our technologies ready? Are they appropriate? Are they uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know suitable for? For different types and different forms of uh, cities that we currently have, we also have to look at those, uh, no, uh, because uh, there's not really a one size fits all solution. No, uh, each city having its own uh, identity will uh, assume uh, its own uh, form or um, uh, claim of uh, being a smart. And we should, I think, we should be ready to support all of these uh, uh, cities that have uh, their. Uh, unique set of uh, aspirations, and uh, I think uh, as has been as has been uh, emphasized, it's not really just about the technology. Of, of course, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a big it's a, it's an essential part of it, but it, not all um, not all of the things that we aspire for can be immediately solved by these technologies. They're good implements, they're good tools, but at the end of the day, I'd like to again go back to the thought that it's the aspiration. That matters, right. no? uh, the collective aspirations of the citizens forming the cities, uh, which matters most, no? and uh, the drive towards inclusivity, sustainability, and if I may say, resilience are also important aspects to consider as we uh, uh, as we uh, drive all of these programs and uh, initiatives for smart city development. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edi. Paring it very up. Uh... Uh, final words to cap our discussion. Maraming salamat po. And friends, please join me in thanking our paper authors led by um, uh, Ms. Tatum Ramos and Dr. Uh, Marifel Ballesteros. And of course, our reactors, Mayor Bernard D. of the City of Kawayan in Isabela Province, Executive uh, Director Enrique Parinit of Tishard, and Attorney Rainer Milan Milanes of the National Privacy Commission. Let us give all of them a big virtual clap. Okay, so um, before we finally close, uh, I would like to announce the winners of our poll because what we did was um, randomly pick uh, two, winner, two winners each from Facebook and from um, uh, WebEx. Uh, okay, from, from among those who participated uh, in our poll, no? And uh, um, as a token of our appreciation, we will give them a prize. And the winners are uh, from Webex, Jessa Aquino and Richard Mel Caplis. Jessa Aquino and Richard uh, Mel Caplis. And from Facebook, uh, Judith Galon uh, Maclang. Okay, so to, uh, to all the winners, our webinar team will contact you for your prize. Okay, and we have uh, some final words. Okay. Some final uh, reminders, okay? So friends, you can access all the presentations from today's webinar from um, the PIDS website and flash also on the screen is the link to the full study, okay? Um, please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. Um, and your comments are very important uh, to us to improve our uh, virtual events no so please take time to um, answer the feedback survey also please uh, visit our website and follow us on our social media pages we also have a youtube channel where you can find all the webinar the recordings of our uh, webinars as well as um, the recordings of our uh, past uh, seminars yung mga face-to-face -face seminars namin before the pan uh, before the pandemic 
And also, thank you sa lahat ng uh, who tuned in sa ating uh, Facebook uh, account as well as sa ating uh, Twitter for the live updates of this virtual event. And flash on the screen are our webinars uh, next month in April. No? So we have three webinars. On April 7, we will be talking about um, promoting the welfare of overseas Filipino workers. On April 21, our topic is on modern biotechnology application and regulation in the Philippines. And on April 28, we will have um, we will feature PIDS studies on uh, that which assess the implementation of the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act. Okay, and finally, we would like to acknowledge um, the various organizations from the government, civil society, business, and international development community who joined us today. Maraming salamat po. So we are closing this webinar with 314 participants on WebEx and on Facebook. Uh, marami rin tayong uh, 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 viewers, no? nearly, uh, nearly 100 uh, viewers. So maraming maraming salamat po. This concludes our webinar for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you next month for our... Uh, a webinar series for the month of April. Maraming salamat po.